one moment. Um, you know, I just wanted to say to you, and I say this on behalf of the council, I didn't talk to the rest of the council though, so I didn't want to violate open meeting law, but we know your birthday's coming up and you only turn, <laughs> you only turn 50 once, so. Right. <laughs> oh, bless you. <laughs> Happy birthday, Mayor. <laughs> oh. And just happens to be chocolate. That looks pretty good. Chocolate. I'm sorry, my birthday's over a holiday. Oh. <laughs> oh. Never mind. <laughs> All right, we will formally call this meeting to order. Therefore, uh, I believe you need to call roll. Councilman DeCicio. Councilwoman Gallego. Here. Councilman Nowakowski. Councilwoman Pastor. Councilwoman Stark. Councilman Valenzuela. Here. Councilman Waring. Here. Mayor Williams. Here. We have, uh, Maria, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Mi nombre es Marielena Garcia. Soy intérprete del idioma español. Si algunos de ustedes necesitan ayuda durante esta reunión o a cualquier momento, por favor, me lo deja saber. Gracias. Thank you. Um, citizens' comments, right here. I cannot see the timer. This is an opportunity for citizens to come forward. Each has two minutes to speak. Joanne Scott Woods, you're first. Mayor and City Council, I have two petitions on transparency. The first with transparency on funding goals for our police department, and the second a model for increased transparency on officer-involved shootings. The first, uh, the title of the first explains it all. External transparency on funded goals of the Phoenix Police Department's 2017 to 2019 strategic plan through a horizontal bar chart chart tracking real-time progress through four stages of achievement planning ordering receipt or hiring of staff and completion of the process the tucson and police and fire departments have developed a chart for tracking their annual progress on the use of funds received from the half cent sales tax increase in 2017 known as tucson delivers i'm submitting their model for consideration for charting of funded goals such as training on race and equity services of an on-site psychologist in an early intervention system plus expansion of our body worn pr camera program. Our community and our department will be well served by the awareness it brings to all in urgent anticipation of preventing death and injury. The second petition asks for consideration of a model for internal and external transparency on officer involved shootings from the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Currently, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of officers involved shootings. There's also increased the demand for accountability and transparency from citizens. The Las Vegas Department website under transparency has a vision statement for the Office of internal oversight that clearly states, quote, our vision is to significantly reduce deadly force incidents, unquote. Each officer involved shooting incident listed, listed allows the citizen to view the following three documents, district attorney's decisions, force of investigation team reports, office of internal oversight review. Additional documents may include videos and press releases. Application of this best practice model, which provides transparency through primary source documentation and official records of decisions, reports, and reviews offers us an opportunity to further strengthen the trust between our community and our department that began in 2010 with Councilman Michael Johnson's Phoenix police altercation and began once more in 2015 following the officer-involved shooting of Remain Brisbane. Trust can only be built on transparency and constant communication. And I have the, and I have copies for the council. Uh, next is Leonard Clark, followed by Brent Kleinman. Hello, council members and mayor. My name is Leonard Clark. I have lived here in Phoenix all of my life, except for a few stints in the Army in the Middle East. 
Uh, I'm here to speak about some items of concern. I have some fellow human rights uh, uh, residents of Phoenix who are here today uh, to speak to you about their concern for traumatic counseling. I know on item 52, uh, if some of our brothers and sisters don't know, you will be appropriating, probably voting for money for traumatic counseling for police officers. I'm not even saying that's wrong. But what I am saying is, it's rather curious that you would appropriate funding for that and not appropriate funding for, say, somebody sitting on a city bus, whether it is a child, an adult, watching somebody be shot and killed by a police officer, any, you know, an official city act, and then those folks can't get proper counseling. So I'm hoping you'll approve that funding. Further, former Phoenix City Mayor Greg Stanton made a promise and said that he had changed the racist signs for our indigenous brothers and sisters underneath Piastewa Mountain. I was there yesterday. Those signs are still up. The racist official City of Phoenix signs are still there. The, mayor had, the former mayor had plenty of time to change the names he did not. I would ask that you please correct his broken promise. Third, I'm curious about garbage cans on the sidewalks. Uh, essentially, when the garbage come, the, the people come, the sanitation to pick up our garbage, I'm concerned because, you know, our, our people that are physically challenged, our brothers and sisters in wheelchairs, cannot go down the sidewalks. But if I put my garbage can on the street, would I or would a homeowner be indemnified against lawsuit if uh, a car runs into the garbage cans while they're out on the street awaiting that same day for the sanitation workers? Or should they place their garbage cans on the sidewalks? Uh, I will be speaking to you on item 52 for traumatic counseling for officers. If you're going to approve that, why not for the people who witness traumatic events as well? Thank you. Thank you. Brent? And Wes Harris will follow him. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. I am here today for, I guess, a couple of reasons. One, the budget, and two, to speak about civility in the City Council and government in general. It, it's, this past week has shown how bad it can get, and I, I ask as a couple very strenuous topics come up that the City Council remembers the civility and the decency in which this council works best. I know there are many different opinions on a lot of different items, but I ask that the respect and decency continue and grow within this city council. And tied to that, I look to the item on the agenda or on the August ballot of moving our city council elections to November even years. Moving our election to November risks the chance of our elections getting more dangerous, more vitriolic, and more negative. And I believe the city of Phoenix has risen above that in the past, and I hope it continues to rise above that in the future. And I hope that people who are possibly here today listening or on YouTube or wherever watching this on the website, that they consider voting no on that ballot item because it's important that the city of Phoenix stays nonpartisan as best it can. And if we move that election to November, it is impossible for that to continue even though members of the city council have claimed that won't happen. So those are my items that I'd like to bring forward to the council today and I appreciate you listening. And lastly, with uh, the first lady coming into town tomorrow, I hope any protests that are around her visiting any shelters or anything is all peaceful and that Phoenix represents itself in its best light possible because we are a good city. We take care of anyone who comes into our city and we treat them with respect. So thank you very much. Thank you. Wes Harris. Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, since it's not on the agenda, uh, I'm here to just harken back to last week and two long sessions on the light rail uh, push through South Phoenix. Uh, I just want you to know that the, that the citizens that are opposed to that are not going away. Uh, I have pulled a packet today to put this on an initiative. Uh, if this council fails to act in the interest of those who do not want this light rail in their economic engine. The South Phoenix Central Avenue is the only retail uh, engine, economic engine in South Phoenix. You can't find another street that has that many businesses on it. Yet, 
we want to destroy that. It makes no fiscal sense at all. Uh, the fact that light rail is inefficient is, is a whole other argument, but just that one issue alone and the fact that longtime business people who have resided down there for 35 and 45 years were not even approached before this was proposed is, is, is just ludicrous. Whether they're late or whether they're early, the voice of the people need to be honored. You are our representatives. You are not our officials. You are representatives elected to represent those that are your constituents. And those constituents say, no, by no means do we want light rail on our, on our signature street in South Phoenix. If you have to put it in, which I don't think you do, 7th Street would make a lot more sense. Uh, there's no school on Central, but there's South Mountain High School on 7th. If you want kids to be using the light rail, that's the one. But again, I don't want it there at all. Use those funds for something else. Thank you very much. Thank you. J.J. Uh, Johnson. Mayor, council members. There's been a lot of talk about civility today. And it seems like that's a strange topic given the amount of violence that we have here in the city of Phoenix. By my math, we year to date, we've recorded uh, Phoenix Fire responding to 489 gun, uh, calls for service on gunshot wounds. Uh, we've had 75 gunshot wounds uh, that Phoenix Fire has rolled on uh, since June 1st. Our failure to interdict gun violence in Phoenix creates a more difficult, more hostile environment for police officers to work in. They are more, they expect that people are going to have guns when they go on calls. And this turns into a self-licking ice cream cone of misery because they can rely on the training that they got with regard to Tennessee versus Garner and Graham v. Connor to shoot with impunity. I've had conversations with Commander Smith about ways that he could interdict uh, guns, and he's chosen not to. We need new leadership in public safety in the city of Phoenix that will help take care of this. And if you're doing any math, we're on pace to be almost as violent as Chicago, the city that everybody likes to use as the bugaboo. Thank you. Lincoln Ryansdale Jr. And then Blue Falls. Hello, I'm Lincoln Ragsdale Jr. I have two pieces of property um, along the light rail. One's at Carter and Central Avenue and the other piece is on Broadway and Central Avenue. I'm pro-development and also I supported the light rail during the time of the uh, vote that was given many years ago. I understand the financial impact and how the city council is, really wants to have jobs to the city. In regards to looking at the city's design, I wanted the city to look at the auto and bike shared lane. They have a concept in San Diego. I have pictures of that that I'd like to give the city of council to take a look at that. That if we could have as many two lanes as possible on both sides and narrow down where maybe the city has not, can't buy the property or whatever so that we're able to have this project to move forward as uh, if possible, but more importantly that we have transportation and economic future development in that, that we don't kill that off, not only the local people that are there now. Um, I didn't see on the budget where the light rail had a line item. I didn't understand if it was under the transportation 2050, the Federal Operation Trust Grant, or the Community Reinvestment Fund. So I wasn't clear on how that was done on the budget. Um, as you know, um, we had the impact on 11th Street and Jefferson on both sides, so I understand the light rail and how it does affect the businesses. And I appreciate this opportunity to express myself and my concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much. Blue? Good 
Good afternoon, and great to see you guys in the group that you are. Um, part of what was happening, what, three years ago, Thelda, when they were bringing this up before the Valley Metro Board, the South Phoenix Extension, um, I kind of got up there on my little hind legs and said, bike lane, can't take it out, it's got to be there, and we got reassurances from Wolf Growth that uh, that's going to make sure that it's going to be there. When I saw what happened at the RPTA this last time, and Groat was in the hallway saying, well, we're going to do this and going to do that, one of the things I didn't hear him say he was going to do is make sure my little bike lane is still on Central Avenue. And also, if you recall back then, I said, you can't be taken out lanes of traffic. Everything is grandfathered. I just was upset why it was going to cost $250,000 to move some irrigation ditches. That, if by my recollection, it was correct, since the roadways were already there, those ditches had to be at the level that they should have been. So, just trying to make sure that if it does continue, and I hear what these people are saying, the outreach may have needed to be better done, but then when it comes to changes within the system, as you know, I've continued to ask why the system, both the City of Phoenix and Valley Metro, every business within your confines has to put together a thing for the feds showing what their citizens would do, their employees, if they were to be able to uh, use transit and such, and they put in, well, if the bus was here or there. We don't look at that. We don't use that. So when it comes to the public input on changing and expanding the system, what it is is staff gets together and says, well, we can now go here, we'll have a meeting and see if uh, the public wants to agree to do that, where in actuality we aren't getting out there and figuring out how 24 hours, seven days a week, every major and minor arterial, and if there is a street here in this city that's good enough for a car, where's the bus? Because we've also been paying for that with our sales tax all along, and that wasn't just the uh, $350 million to put the 303 exchange in, that was also to get our part done and then lastly, as I pointed out at the last meeting of the RPTA board, there was, what, uh, 10 million in set aside for future projects for the rail of bus money, and then there was also next year you're gonna have 17 million in future money for the rail. Where's that money going for buses? One-third of your shelters aren't. You need to get it up to speed. Thank you, and I'll see you at 35. Thank you. Do I have time for any more public comment? That's all the cards I... Sorry about that. Uh, 24 hour paragraph, please. The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G6464 and G6474 through 6478, S44749 and S44824 through 44863 and resolutions 21649 and 21652 through 21653. Uh, boards and commissions, do we have a motion? Motion to approve mayor's <laughs> boards and commission nominations. Second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Uh, approve the council boards and commission nominations. I'm, are you moving? Are you going to do? Are you going to go to the pictures? 
Are we going to do them all together? We're doing council. Right. Yeah. Uh, motion to approve uh, city council boards and commission nominations. Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. I'm going to ask the vice mayor to swear them in. I state your name. Do you solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States? And the Constitution and laws of the State of Arizona. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties. Of the office of, of the office of South Phoenix Office of the Fire Pension Board. Police Pension Board. It's always a muddle, but you guys did well. <laughs> According to the best of my ability, so help me God. According to the best of my ability, so help me God. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I believe this brings us to a spatial meeting time. Liquor. No. Oh, liquor license. I guess I'm just anxious to get to that. Are right, you ready, Mayor? I am. Motion to approve item three. Uh, oh, excuse me, motion to withdraw item three because the application has been withdrawn uh, at the state of Arizona and motion to approve item four. Second. We have a motion and a second. <coughs> uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Now we get to go to the spatial meeting. <laughs> Item five is convening a spatial meeting of the council to consider adoption of the 2018-19 budget. In a, Mayor, in accordance with state statute, I move that the regular meeting of the city council be re, uh, recessed and the city uh, council convene a special meeting to consider adoption of the budget. Second. Second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item six is a request for reconsideration of item 65 from the June 20, 2018 formal council meeting. Wherein you want to move this? <laughs> I move that item 65 from the June 20th, 2018 formal council meeting to be reconsidered. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. I believe that's 7 0. Uh, item 7 is the adoption of the final 2018 2019 annual operating funds budget. Councilwoman Stark. Yes. Mayor, I move that item 7 being ordinance S. 44749, the final 2018-2019 annual operating funds budget be adopted. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Um, I do have some cards. Uh, we'll have the cards come up first. Brent, behind me. Brent. Uh, 
the other three cards do not wish to speak, but would be entered into the record. I have. Oh, he might have been downstairs. Oh, here, here, Brent. Sorry, I lost my seat up here. Um, Ms. Mayor, members of the City Council, I just want to come up and uh, share my <coughs> approval of passing this budget and getting us on track for July 1st and our upcoming fiscal year. And I believe any compromises or agreements that have been made between the last meeting and today should put us in good shape to go forward. So I urge everyone on the City Council to vote yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, in opposition, Barry Diana. Hernandez. Okay. Good afternoon, Council. Um, I am opposing this budget for what we have been doing for the last four months. Police violence in the city has already a record breaking, is already record breaking, and now it is growing. The current count of deaths is 15, the count of shootings is 27. But it's more than that. Phoenix PD's violence shows up in heavy targeting of the west side and the south side of Phoenix. It is a culture of cover-ups, of reassignments, and a col collaboration with ICE. And it's a lack of empathy or skills to deal with people that are mentally ill, that are scared, that are vulnerable, or that are traumatized. Every year, city council expands the police budget and the police force, expanding the violence as well. Just this weekend, we had in District 5, Dor Marco that was traumatized by Phoenix PD. And then I guess this is for Councilman Valenzuela. I would like to know what is happening and what you are doing about that. Dor Marco is a blind man who was going to the restroom, who couldn't find his way. Police never identified themselves as officers, but instead hurt him, beat him, jailed him while his eight-year-old daughter, who is also blind, waited for him outside. This is the reality of what's happening, and this just happened this weekend. Every, every year, you take money from us that funds police force, that shoots, that kills, that hurts our neighbors. Every year, you take money, thousands of dollars, from undocumented Phoenicians and fund a police force that is collaborating with ICE. Cities all over, the country, all over the country are using their power to stop family separation, to resist ICE, and to hold police accountable for violence. The mayor of Atlanta just blocked ICE from using city jails. Oakland's mayor warned her constituents about upcoming ICE raids. Atlanta, Austin, Baltimore, Chicago, Columbus, Dane County, Oakland, Almeida County, Prince George County, Sacramento, San Antonio, Santa Ana, all resist deportations with the Legal Defense Fund. Thank you. The time and silence is over. It is time that you start doing your part to defend our families and defend our communities. Thank you. Reallocate the general funds and create a legal defense fund and trauma compensation fund for the people that are being victimized by this police department. Thank you. Alexis Benuelos. Hello, members of city council. Community has turned out again at the city council meeting to tell you that it is not too late to resist violence in deportations in Phoenix. This fight is not just about the deaths that have happened. This is about the deaths that will come because the council is doing nothing to deter police violence. This is about a council that finances a police force that hands our people over to ICE and in just the last month has killed Robbie Brown, Alexander Aldrich, and Ronald Barney. Last week, Laura Pastor and Michael Nowakowski stalled the city budget because it is clear that the voices of the community are not heard or respected in this chamber. Even though we saw them stand with the community symbolically, nothing has been done since then to engage the community making this call. Instead, there is another vote on an unchanged budget, and it is expected for council members to shut up, vote yes, and fall in line. You forget, you forget, all of you, that this is our money and our lives on the line. 
Will you continue to be complicit with family separation? This is a full-on humanitarian crisis occurring at the U.S.-Mexico border, 150 miles from this room. Every time Phoenix PD coordinates with ICE, it is complicit in family separation. Every time PD lies, beats, or covers up, it is complicit in violence. Proves community that you hear us, that you care about our safety, add these demands, or else don't pass the budget. We don't want your budget, we want a people's budget. Thank you. Thank you. J.J. Johnson, you may sit down now. You're disruptive and your time is up. As I have looked at this budget, I am ashamed that the city of Phoenix continues to collaborate with Immigration and Customs Enforcement. It is tearing our neighborhoods apart. It is not the best use of the funds that you've been entrusted with. You are stewards of public funds. The public does not want you spending our resources on collaborations with ICE. It's time to stop. Thank you. Wes Harris. Madam Mayor, members of council. I don't think he's donating his time to you, so sit down. Or you can leave. Sit down, please. Sit down. I was going to talk about the budget, and I will, but I can't. I understand. Officers, would you like to escort them out, please? They are out of order. I, wor I work with Damien Gosler. You Gosa. can wait till they leave. Okay. City Council, stay in silence. Police stay in silence. City Council, stay in silence. Police stay in silence. City Council, stay in silence. Police stay in silence. City Council, stay in silence. Police stay in silence. You're killing us. I'm sorry for the interruption. Thank you. Start. I can't let that go without uh, talking about a current event that uh, happened very close to the area that I work in, in South Phoenix between 20 and 21st Street, south of Southern. Two young boys were murdered this week, and it wasn't by policemen. And we need to know that as our policemen are out there helping and protecting us all, and the more, the better. I came up against the budget last week, mainly because it didn't strike me as being a budget, because it didn't show us anything about where we were and where we intended to go. There were no comparisons. There was no comparison to last year. There was no comparison to last year's budget. I'm not against passing the budget. We need to pass a budget to move forward. I want that made clear. But I do suggest to you strongly that you insist in the future that that which you see as council members in private, in your offices, presented by the city of Phoenix, is also available to us. Not to have to go online, but if you're going to put it on the agenda, then on that agenda should be the budget that, you, that you've been reviewing for these many weeks. And, and that's really my message. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sean Severin. Mayor and members of council, uh, thank you for hearing me today. Um, I would just like to ask you to vote no again um, on this budget. Uh, unless you're actually going to utilize the community outreach, the feedback that you get in those sessions, there's really no point in having them. It's a complete head fake. So um, listen to the community. Uh, vote no until uh, you actually um, put in what needs to be in this budget. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the cards I have that wish to speak. 
I do have cards um, that are in favor. Frank Basile. I think I just Steve Berline, Ken Crane, Mario Alaya, Mike Nunez, Joe Garcia. Does the council have any questions? I do. Go ahead. We are on, I'm just going through my booklet because we are five and six, now we're on seven. Uh, reconsider the budget. Mm -hmm. um, I have made a request, I want to say it was two years ago, and had a meeting with um, the city manager and our budget director regarding participatory budgeting. Um, in that conversation, uh, there, I also brought in uh, several people from the community uh, speaking about participatory budgeting and uh, the concept and how it happens. Uh, that was two years ago and today uh, we stand uh, two years later still operating in the same way uh, the city has operated for the last 25 years on the budget. I would like for the city manager to look at participatory budgeting for the future. I think there could be a hybrid of participatory budget and tradition, but uh, I would really like to look at that and be able to uh, truly engage the community on the budget process. Um, secondly, uh, up to this point, uh, I have not supported the budget items, and I haven't supported the budget items, not because I don't support the items in the budget, uh, it's because the uh, community has asked for some items to be part of the budget. Not all items uh, can be part of the budget, and years after years, they have been told what the process is and what they do and how they go about putting items in the budget. And I feel that there are traumatic events that do happen in the community. And what I mean by that, and I just want to make this very clear, uh, this is not anti-police. What I mean by that is there are people that are witnesses to some very violent or traumatic incidents. And I would like to know, and I know that fire does this because I was on a ride along and I happened to show up to an incident where a man hung himself and he had been there for two days. I walked in, I smelt the smell I was asked if I was willing to go in to uh, witness what was in the room. I chose not to. However, there was a um, witness that was the one who walked in and found everything and saw everything and was having a traumatic breakdown at that moment. And there were no resources at that moment for that witness. I, who the person that I am, was in the midst of, wait a minute, we're having a meltdown right here, I need help. I was told not to engage because of the whole incident that I was witnessing. So I do believe that there should be um, some type of intervention or traumatic intervention, and I would like to do an analysis of what we have and what we don't have and where the gaps are and be able to bring uh, behavioral health specialists and, and have a collaborative uh, and looking at, at, uh, looking at what we have and what we don't have. Those are just some of the suggestions. Um, and it would bring in the nonprofit and the community and really build a collective impact. Uh, my faith is that next year we will be at a different point to have a dialogue where we'll be at a different point um, and looking at, at items that are happening in the community and look at ways that we can assist. 
So um, I want to thank all the members and the employees that met with me. I also want to thank all of those this week that met with me on South Central Light Rail to discuss the action la last week. And at the end of the day, as I told everybody as I was meeting with them, I always do the right thing. I always think of everybody. And to have faith in the way I'm leading you. So in that, I will end. And I will be saying I'm voting for the budget. Thank you. Um, I know we had a talk about it. I think some of the concerns you just expressed are completely legitimate. And as mayor, I can create a task force that I would like to uh, have your suggestions, who else you'd like to be on it, not only on the council. So if you could send that to me, I can do that without council action. So I would be glad to do that. Because I think we have a lot of resources that people could tap into, but people aren't aware of them. So if we could have a resource guide or something to give to people, I think that would be great in the future. Uh, anyone else? Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, after meeting with our staff, I had some issues about our parks, especially the security. I have six children and going to the parks and participating in softball, baseball, soccer, football. Um, one of the concerns I have is the after hours. And one of the issues I've been advocating for is making sure we have park rangers out there in our parks, uh, especially after hours, after dark. And we're up to about 77 park rangers. Back in 2007, 2008, when I started as a council member, we had 81. This budget is allocating two more park rangers. Hopefully by next year, we're talking about getting back to that 81 park rangers as we had back in 2007, 2008. So I really want to thank our staff, especially our parks um, director for sitting down and, and, and trying to advocate for more park rangers out there. And the other thing with the parks is that we started a great program and I want to really thank um, Laura Pastor, the chair of the um, parks subcommittee and advocating for a mobile um, rec unit. Basically, these are units that where we don't have um, youth centers or recreation centers that we actually have vans and vehicles that go out there and they're kind of like pop-up um, centers that have activities and, and help our children um, stay off the streets and get them into positive activities. Um, one of the concerns I have is that over the summertime, um, those units are, we, we don't have a program, the, the unit doesn't continue. And I believe that during the summertime is when we actually have more use um, for those um, rec, uh, recreational mobile units because our kids need to be, they need some type of activity, especially during the summertime. Our director of our parks and, um, and our staff said that they're working on finding the funding to make sure that, especially in those areas and all the different districts where there isn't a youth center or a recreational center for, for young people, that that would be the <clears throat> main target to making sure that we have year-round uh, mobile recreational um, units. So I want to thank our parks for, for working on those both issues that I had. The other thing is the downtown area. Um, for the last three years, we've been hearing the situation with the growing um, homeless community within our, in our parks and camping out and, and sleeping out in our parks. So um, it's taken us about two years to, to put it on our budget agenda and we finally got um, Phoenix Cares. So I really want to thank our staff for that. But also, um, we looked at hiring um, private security um, to actually go out there and help out with um, the Civic Space, Margaret Hans Park, and Heritage Park. And right now, we're about $150,000 that it costs. And I want to thank ASU for contributing the $50,000 to help offset that cost. And I really want to look into more of that um, public-private um, partnerships. You know, we have NAU downtown. We have um, all kinds of alliances with businesses. You know, the Downtown Phoenix Partnership, Phoenix Community Alliance, and many businesses that we can actually partner up to make sure that our downtown is safe and secure. And I, I, our staff is going to be looking into that 
and having meetings with these organizations, with these universities and these businesses to make sure our downtown secure. So once again, I want to thank those individuals that are working on that. And basically the whole, um, um, this is Jim Waring's baby, the um, enhanced municipal districts that we, that we have downtown, um, that we also look for funding um, set aside from, from that district to help us with the um, security of downtown. And, um, and really that's really it. And regarding the, um, I'm the chair of public safety. I hear these young people's cry. One of the things that we asked is um, the police chief and the assistant chief is giving us a full report of the 27 incidents uh, with our police officers. Um, I believe there's always um, three sides to, uh, to a story. Um, their side, our side, and, some, and, and something lies, in, the truth lies in the middle. So what I'm looking for is the truth. So um, right now we're going into an intense um, data and research, finding out what happened in each case. Um, it's gonna be brought back to our subcommittee, the um, public safety subcommittee. At that time, we're also looking at best practices um, throughout the country on how they deal with um, victims we as the city of Phoenix already have all kinds of resources and programs that help out um, victims of domestic violence and that witness um, shootings and the incident that um, Laura Pastor talked about. So we just wanna make sure that we have a list and we make and let the public know that we have these resources and what's available to the public and what's not. So um, with that, Mayor, I I would, I'm also gonna be supportive of the um, budget and I just really want to thank staff for within the last week gathering all this information and coming up with solutions. And um, if you do create a task force, I would love to be on something like that. I was just going to say, I think you volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Amir, thank you for your leadership in making all this possible and bringing people together to, to make this budget pass. Any uh, Councilwoman Stark? Yes, Mayor, I just wanted to thank staff as well, and I thank Councilman Nowakowski for bringing up the park rangers. That's a big issue in our district as well. It is hard when you work for 1.6 million people, and that's what our staff does. Is they work for a lot of people with a lot of different interests. We don't always agree, but I think they do their best, and they bring a budget to us. We do hold hearings, and I agree with Councilwoman Pastor, maybe there's a better way to get the word out. But we hear from so many different interests, from arts, from libraries, from streets. I hear a lot about streets. From our parks, there's just so many different interests. And I, so I applaud our um, staff because they really do try to look at every resident and business in the city of Phoenix to come forward with a good budget. And um, thank you, especially to our budget director. You did a great job. Thank you. Councilman Gallego. Thank you so much. Um, I agree, thank you to our city staff for bringing this forward. It really is a lot of hard work and, thought, and thoughtful co conversation and so many of the projects and new initiatives we undertake throughout the year get their start at city budget meetings when we get suggestions from all over our community. Uh, this budget is very important. It prioritizes uh, first pension investment, so that is the largest uh, new item is the Pension Stabilization Fund, significant investments in public safety, and significant investments in homelessness, and both uh, dramatic expansion and resources for neighborhoods that are impacted by homelessness, but also resources for people who are experiencing homelessness so that we can try to get them into a stable living situation. I think it shows good community values, and I want to thank our city manager and his team for their work on this. I look forward to supporting it. Thank you. Councilman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would like to thank, first of all, everyone who weighed in on the budget uh, in person, by, uh, by making a phone call, sending an email, a text message, whatever the case might be. Thank you for, for uh, being involved in shaping and molding this city by way of, of, of where we put tax dollars, how we invest these tax dollars. That's Moving right. forward, this budget, <clears throat> uh, though not perfect, when you serve a city of 1.6 million, 1.6 plus million, a very diverse city, more than 50 languages spoken in this city, which I think is a strength of ours, uh, it's hard to say we have a perfect budget. 
but, but it's one that was created through a democracy. It's one that was created through a lot of, of meetings, a lot of opportunities to engage, and conducted by uh, a class group of people that, uh, that are uh, city employees. So, uh, so I want to thank our city employees as well. Uh, this budget calls for hundreds of first responders, uh, extended library hours, parks, shade trees, uh, transportation improvements, roadway improvements, and, and the list goes on and on. Something I'm very, very excited about. It's going to improve our city's IT capabilities as we continue to, to move toward becoming the, the city with the, of the future. Uh, it's that type of infrastructure that if you're not paying attention, it, it could get pretty costly and it could actually cost us as a city. Uh, we're actually investing in our IT infrastructure in this budget. Uh, I, I believe it's measured. Uh, it's a reasonable allocation of tax dollars that uh, deals with some of the challenges, such as our homeless issue. Uh, it deals with uh, the challenge and it's addressing uh, paying down some of our, our pension debt. And, and of course, it continues to uh, advance uh, our city by adding more services uh, or enhancing our services, again, such as the extended library hours. And, uh, and I'm, I'm excited for that. So uh, I, am, I remain supportive of this budget. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I just want to make the comment uh, to Ed and Jeff. Uh, you have always been very open. Uh, you have listened, to, especially Jeff. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those that goes through it line by line with pink stickies. Um, then he has to come in and answer my questions. Uh, and I appreciate all the time and effort you put into it and your staff. Uh, we can always improve the process, no doubt about it, get more people to participate, but we always try to be open and fair. And I think this reflects this in this budget. So I too am supporting it. So roll call. Gallego. Yes. Noah Kowski. Yes. Pastor. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. No. Mayor Williams. Yes, seven to one. I adjourn this special meeting. Six one. Oh, six one. That's right. Mine is a person. That's right. Unless you're oh, including Peggy. Else. Are you including <laughs> Peggy Neely? I didn't see her. Yeah, Peggy's right there. Oh. I guess we could count on the council. I was pinched it that way either. I'm going to get myself in big trouble here. <laughs> uh, all right. Very proud of us. We are. Uh, Mayor, I move to approve items 8 through 87, except the following. Items 9, 10, 31, 32, 34, 35, 38, 52, 55, 63, 65, 66, and 81 uh, through 87. Do I have a second? Second. Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. 81 and 82 are out, right? Okay. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. <clears throat> yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. Brings us to item nine. Uh, actually, Mayor, I'm going to, is that what you're going to tell me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules and take items 85 and 86 out of order. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Um, opposed, nay. 7 0. All right. Councilman? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Maybe we should start with the staff recommendation, or I'm sorry, staff report, and uh, then we can we can take our cards. If you're okay with that? I don't have the cards. Okay. Got it. Okay, <laughs> staff report. Then I'll have the applicant can have up to 20 minutes. She can decide how she wants to use it. She can do a presentation or she could split it and do a rebuttal and then audience 20 minutes.
Alan, you're on. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. We can take uh, item 85 and 86 together. They are related items. One is a general plan amendment. The other is a zoning case, but the same subject site. I believe you can take testimony on both those items. We'll just need separate motions at the end on those two items. Okay. With that, uh, item number 85 is a general plan amendment request to go from residential 3.5 to five dwelling units uh, and five dwelling units per acre and residential one to two to a residential two to 3.5 dwelling units per acre, which is right in the middle of the existing general plan uh, designation for this parcel. Staff does recommend approval. Here is the subject site. This is Camelback Ranch here, uh, spring training facility here. The parcel is in the back uh, here. This is a wash corridor coming down here. This is Glendale Airport uh, over on this side. Larger lot, uh, single family residential area here. And then more traditional suburban lot residential a little bit further off. This shows the existing general plan configuration where you see the mix of the 3.5 to five dwelling units per acre. And this is the one to two dwelling units per acre. The applicant is requesting the right in the middle designation of that, which will be two to 3.5 dwelling units per acre shown on that slide right there. Staff does recommend approval of that request. It was uh, approved um, by the Planning Commission uh, and it was uh, not approved by the um, Maryville Village Planning Committee. The zoning case that goes with this is from S1 SP to R110 for single family residential. Staff does recommend approval per the addendum B staff report that came out earlier today. As part of uh, that request, same subject site that we just went through. Uh, this is the corresponding zoning area around it. You see the uh, Camelback Ranch is a special permit to the south. You have, uh, this is ostensibly a, a commercial zoning over here for the airport, and then you have large lot residential here, and then further off residential uh, in the more traditional single family residential. This shows the proposal in terms of density. So you have Matame homes at 32 or 3.2 dwelling units per acre here. You have this larger lot area, which are really 35,000 square foot lots and above is this area here. Then you have some of the traditional surrounding suburban residential uh, designations here and going around here to the south uh, as well. Here's the proposed site plan. Uh, as part of this proposed site plan, the applicant is proposing large lots uh, on this edge, which is 107th Avenue here, to uh, provide a buffer to the existing large lot residential here. There's also a 50-foot landscape setback here, which is much greater than the required 15-foot uh, landscape setback. And then all these homes will front on this side here, and all the traffic access once Ballpark Boulevard is constructed uh, will go out Ballpark Boulevard, none of which will go out to 107th Avenue after uh, Ballpark is constructed. This will help preserve some of the, the open space rule kind of agricultural feel of this side here on 107th Avenue uh, would become just an access point for these larger lots residential here because it doesn't go forward uh, to the north. Um, oops. With that, uh, staff, this was, uh, request was approved by, by the Planning Commission, and uh, staff does recommend approval pursuant to uh, the memo that came out earlier today. The Village Planning Committee uh, did not recommend, uh, make a recommendation on this because they did not approve the general plan, so therefore they did not take up the zoning case. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? If not, I'll invite Jordan Rose, she's the applicant. <clears throat> Now, you have 20 minutes. You can split it however you want if it can do a presentation as well as a rebuttal. Thank you, Mayor. And is there a, a clicker I could use for the PowerPoint? Oh, thank you, Alan. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the council, for your records, I'm Jordan Rose with Rose Law Group. And with me today is Kevin Rust, Rust from Madame Homes, my um, senior planner, Jennifer Hall, Don Cartier from CivTech, and Hillary Tubby from Anderson Barron. Um, I wanted to thank your staff and all of you for all the time that you've spent um, working on this and our neighbors and all of the community. This is really, I've been doing this for a couple decades and this is a great example of solving a regional problem um, in a, a really fairly small zoning case. So let me just go through this and answer any questions. Um, as Alan said, the current general plan allows for a mix of up to five units to acre and two units to the acre. We're asking for 
um, a lower density on part of the site up to 3.5, and our zoning case is just at 3.2. Um, the current plan would allow, currently today, under the general plan, would allow up to 208 homes, and we're proposing 207 homes. We deliberately chose 207 homes because we believed that that was what the general plan um, envisioned in this area as a combination. Um, we've worked with some of the residents to the south and actually um, have, in one week, collected 155 signatures in support at the to the south of Camelback Road. They're excited about this regional solution that I'll talk to you about in a second. And there was not one person in that, in that community that was, that was opposed or even questioning um, the, the, this particular development. Um, we think it's a good fit for the area. We've got Camelback Ranch, the ballpark there next to it, and the Glendale Airport. Um, then we have the R35 community that has 0% community open space. And you can see um, just to every, in every other direction, the densities of these developments are at least 4.2 units per acre. And down here, there's six, up to six units per acre with far less open space than what we're proposing. We're at 15%. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a very, compatible, um, very compatible with the area. And remember, this has been in the general plan for residential homes since, since 1985. And in fact, in 88, 1988, it was zoned for 317 homes. And in 1997, it was zoned for 205 homes. The airport advice, we've been working very hard since the Planning Commission um, and the Glendale Airport Advisory Commission has called this an innovative solution. In fact, one of the advisor, very board members said he was gonna take it across the country to show what we've done with the airport. We've really thanked them. They've been great partners to work with on this. Um, and so they have advised of a, a preference for remaining neutral on the, on the application. We appreciate that. The city of Glendale's in support. The ballpark and the teams are in support. And it certainly didn't start that way. We have signed agreements with them. We have signed development agreement. It's been recorded. Um, and the nature of that agreement is that Mattamy will help to build out Ballpark Boulevard. And that starts at Camelback here. It, goes up to, it will go up to Maryland. It doesn't do that now. It, it terminates here. Um, this is really important from a regional perspective. but. From a, a Mattamy Homes perspective, this small 207 lot community doesn't by any means warrant from a traffic perspective us contributing or building out anything to the north. Um, but Mattamy has taken that approach to extending, helping to extend Ballpark Boulevard because they wanted to be a regional a player and they've entered into an agreement to first of all satisfy the neighbors and we'll talk about that in a second. Secondly, the ballpark and third, the city of Glendale. And finally, to alleviate the traffic flow on Camelback Road, and that's what this is really about. Um, that's a pretty amazing thing for the city of Phoenix. It will remove traffic also from 107th Avenue, and it'll allow for a better flow on event days. Um, all of this without costing Phoenix taxpayers $1, not $1. Um, Mattamy's obligation under this agreement is $850,000. It's non-reimbursable, it's non-creditable, it's a contribution towards this regional solution. And the teams, when the, when the uh, road is built within the next two years, would contribute $150,000. So um, we believe there'll be a very quick build out and we appreciate Glendale working with us and the teams. Um, this is really a great diplomatic regional effort and it's benefiting the neighbors, um, protecting 107th and the Camelback Road drivers especially. Phoenix residents um, not paying a dime for this. This, and, and, and I should note, this was not on the Glendale CIP, so it wasn't like this was going to get built anyhow in the next five years. It wasn't happening for an extended period of time. Um, so it's really a regional thing, um, and, and the baseball team, certainly. And thank you, thank you to them for working with us. Um, so we have the Glendale Air Park not opposed. We have the city of Glendale supporting. We've got the Dodgers, the Chicago White Sox, the baseball team supporting, the Camelback Ranch community. There's everyone we've talked to there. Pendergast Elementary not opposed. Tolleson High School not opposed. City staff supports and Planning Commission recommended approval. And, and we just wanted to point that out because every, all of those players have worked really hard over the last few months and we appreciate it quite a bit to solve some regional problems. So the neighborhood representative 
um, provided us with this list that I know you have a, of requests, and we tried to address all of them um, as best as we could, and we think we've addressed them. Um, first of all, they asked for a 50-foot landscape buffer and a 10-foot um, equestrian trail, and I want to show you where that is because we've actually extended it. So here's the 50-foot, and while these folks that live in the Mattamy community may like horses, they're not going to have horses on their property because it won't be allowed in their, in their CCNRs. So this equestrian trail is really for, for these folks here. Mattamy's paying for it. They're not paying for it. The city of Phoenix taxpayers aren't paying for it. Mattamy's paying to maintain it. And then we also added equestrian trail on the south and the north so that they could get over to the, the amenity there. Um, the next thing was they asked for a reduced number of lots along 107th Avenue. We reduced that from 46 lots to 16 lots. Um, and then I'll show you how that looks um, there. And then we, we grew those lots um, to 18,000 square feet minimum. Um, so they're large lots along the perimeter. Um, and that's in your stipulations. And we were stipulating that at least 50% of those would be single story homes. Um, they also asked that we stipulate to a percentage of homes uh, within the rest of the community be single story. We'd agreed to stipulate that 30 percent within 200 feet would be single story. Now, I should note that currently the zoning would allow for two story homes on the entire site with access onto 107th Avenue. Um, we're, we have no access on 107th and, and we're limiting our two story homes. Um, and you can see that the closest residential neighbor to our site would be 148 feet away. So the ability for them to even distinguish between a one and two story home will be very, very difficult from that distance. Um, we're stipulated to emergency access only on 107th Avenue. And I know the neighbors had asked for no access at all, but I think from a public safety standpoint, we have to have provide for emergency access. But you'll see we put it at the very southern border. It's gated and it's skewed toward the south, so you can't, you know, you can't easily drive north, but there would be no reason to drive north because there's no way out of this community. There's a canal here and a canal there. Um, but if you drive out, if emergency responders were hopeful that there won't be many emergency calls here, but if there are, they would go past um, a, a few homes to get to Camelback Road. But hopefully that won't occur very often. Um, if at all. Um, the applicant agrees to develop 107th uh, at the minimal standards that are approved by the county staff, and, and we'll do that. Um, we've also agreed to prohibit short-term rentals in our CCNRs. Um, that was something they asked. Um, they also asked that we work with the airport, and we have done that, and we've prohibited um, noise complaints. Um, in fact, in our CCNRs, the residents will be fined, which is, which is um, uh, it will be will be good. Um, and then they asked for a specific agreement between to show an agreement between the cities, the ballpark, and us and the neighbors. And we've shown we have a recorded agreement between the entities that we could do that with. And then the neighbor agreement, I think, are the enforceable stipulations that you put on this zoning case today, if you if you so choose. And then the big one, and and I saved this for last, even though it was number one on their list, was that we agreed to build out ballpark from the property to Maryland, which we've talked about here. Um, but I wanted to just point out, um, we, we know that was very important to them. April 5th, um, the neighbor representative testified at a planning commission hearing that another critical issue is no ingress and egress on 107th except for emergency personnel, which we've done now, and that the road being built is essentially a deal breaker for the, for the neighboring community. Um, and then again on April 5th, uh, testifying to reiterate access on 107th Avenue and the extension of Ballpark are two critical deal breakers, deal breakers for the neighborhood. And then on May 3rd, we had another um, planning commission where the chairman asked Mr. Lunsford what the neighbor would need to move forward and he stated, the this is in your minutes, stated the completion of Ballpark from its terminal point to Maryland and a written agreement uh, um, of all of these things is needed. It would make the, the neighbors more comfortable and so I'm hopeful that we've, we've done that. Um, we were, uh, on Thursday, we were presented with another request that wasn't on that sheet of paper that we, we, we literally have carried around with us to all of our internal meetings with Mattamy, and they've gone through and really tried their hardest to meet all of those things. So the, the request was to lower the density, 
And so we reviewed the past record to say like, hey, have we, we thought that that issue had been resolved. We didn't represent Mattamy during Maryville's planning commission or village commission, but the letter that they submitted in opposition had all sorts of issues but didn't mention density. Um, then we looked at um, the open house that we had um, on the 14th of June, and there were three opposed because of traffic, four opposed saying no houses, leave it as farmland, three opposed saying it's not a good fit. There were 13 people there total. And then three of them said we wanted half acre lots. So then last Thursday we met with the, uh, four of the neighbors and um, a neighbor representative from the greater area, and they requested half acre lots. And then I called Mr. Lensford um, this last week to say that we couldn't we couldn't make that happen with all of the other things. And he suggested 150 lots total. Um, I wanted to note that from our pre-application, when we submitted our pre-app to the city, it's in your public record, we had a density of 221. We lowered it to 207, the reason being we had some feedback and thought that we should lower it to a number that was permitted today um, with a density calculation. And so we, we did that, um, or my client did that. And then, um, the 3.2 is two units lower than any of the other adjacent residential surroundings except for the R35 neighbors. Um, and you can see that here. So we think it's a good fit for the area. Um, it's lower than what's currently approved in the general plan, up to 208 units. And the very low density next to residential, like asking for uh, 150 units next to a residential, next to, I'm sorry, next to an airport would be pretty incompatible, um, two to the acre residential right up against an airport might not be the best planning decision. And um, that we're also just, the 3.2 allows us to fulfill all of those items that were on that neighbor's list that we, we, we really took as the standard of what they, what they wanted because we had no other reason to believe that, that that wasn't it. So we think it protects the equestrian community um, by no traffic and alleviation of traffic on Camelback. So 16 lots abutting 107th, a setback of 148 feet from the nearest neighbor, no access on 107th. We don't believe there's any measurable, will be any measurable impact on the, the, the community. And I just wanted to close right now to say Mattamy, and that's a seed, <laughs> um, and they were, um, <laughs> in case you're wondering, um, and, they, and they, they really do feel quite honored to be, while it's been a crazy bit of a process, they feel quite honored to have planted potentially 207 homes and solved this great regional problem. And that's a pretty, pretty great thing. So um, we thank our partners for that. And then I would save the rest of my time for um, <coughs> comments or okay. any questions. Thank you. How much time does she have left? Seven minutes? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we also have a card from David Williams. Good what afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of the council, and council member and extraordinary planner, Deborah Stark. It's nice to see you again. Um, I am, uh, as you mentioned, David Williams. I'm the planning administrator for the city of Glendale here, representing the city of Glendale. You should have received a letter of support from the city. Uh, Ms. Rose is accurate in that we've spent extensive time negotiating certain concerns um, that this, and interests that the city has with this property being adjacent to the airport. Uh, so in summary, uh, we reached an agreement on airport at navigation easement. Uh, we reached agreement on disclosure to future residences or residents uh, regarding lights, noise, and traffic associated with the baseball stadium and its grounds for not only baseball use, but other use. Um, we've reached agreement on the roadway contribution for a regional roadway connection that we believe will help take pressure off of Camelback Road, as well as provide connectivity to the north and will significantly improve future traffic conditions as well existing traffic situations with the spring training facility. So we are here to support the rezoning today, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Councilwoman, did you have a question? Ellen, I just wanted to know what the de current density is at this moment, what the proposal is. It's two, uh, Mayor, I know it was going back and forth, so. Mayor Williams, Councilwoman uh, Pastor, currently they're proposing 207 dwelling units okay, as part of their application. You. Thank you. John Cates. 
Thank you, Mayor, members of the, of the council. My name is John Cadis. I represent the Chicago White Sox, the Los Angeles Dodgers, and uh, Camelback Ranch Baseball. Uh, as you know, we started out opposed to this project uh, because of the lack of access to the north. Um, we are really grateful for um, the folks at Mattamy Homes being willing to participate in the funding of a road to the north. Um, I'm here to not only support the project, but to thank a lot of people uh, who came to the table to, to make it work. I, I would like to also say, I know that some of the neighbors uh, to the east are still opposed to the project. They are wonderful people. They're wonderful people to work with. Uh, we love them as fans at the park. Uh, the neighbors to our south uh, who are in support of this project, we are really grateful for them as well. Uh, we are really appreciative of your staff. Uh, Alan has been so responsive um, to our calls. Uh, your city manager has done a great job. Even a shout out to your clerk, Chris Myers, who never gets a shout out. He, did, <laughs> he does an awesome job as well. And I wanna thank uh, Glendale for uh, their leadership on the development agreement that we uh, put together with Mattamy Homes. Uh, as you know, the teams, the Dodgers and the White Sox are participating in the construction of this project as well. Uh, we're putting up money if the road gets built on time. And so we are fully uh, uh, expecting and very optimistic that that will happen thanks to the partnership that's here today. So I'm happy to answer any questions, but we're in support. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's all the cards I have in support. I have um, several cards for opposition. And Jack Lunsford, you're first. I have two minutes. I do have a couple who have donated other time to other people, but I don't I'm, have them donated to you. Thank you, um, Mayor and members of the council. Um, it, with your permission, I'd like for Jeff O'Toole to go first, follow, followed by Jennifer Maxwell, and then I will finish up if, if, with your permission, please. And the others have yielded a lot of time to us. Okay, Jeff O'Toole. Thank you. You have up to six minutes. Okay, perfect. Uh, our neighborhood has a presentation as well. While that's coming up for your records, my name is Jeff O'Toole. I live at 4645 North 101st Avenue in Phoenix, directly south of this proposed property. I appreciate uh, Madam Mayor and uh, members of council the opportunity to speak to you guys today. Um, we want to start by talking about the general plan. Uh, the general plan is the guideline for development in the city of Phoenix. Many members on this very council have championed the development of this plan as the basis for zoning decisions. Lots of meetings, lots of taxpayer dollars, this is supposed to be the guide we're using to make these decisions. One of the things that it points out is that the village planning committee system is the foundation for this collaboration. The idea is that our most closely represented group in the neighborhood are the ones best equipped to make the decision on what's good or not for the residents of the community. As was noted before, Maryville voted 7-1 against this proposal. I think the members of council should really think about the reason why the local village committee voted overwhelmingly against this plan that's in front of you today. When we talk about the general plan and the guidelines, it's really all around uh, certainty and character of the neighborhoods. So we have to ask ourselves, what makes these communities unique? And one of the things that was noted in uh, the presentation by Ms. Rose was the zoning in all these different neighborhoods. She didn't mention the only neighborhood that actually borders this property. There's only one residential neighborhood that borders this property, and it's this one. And this is what it looks like. It's horse properties. It's large lots. This is the assets that we have in this community to protect. So when we go through a rezoning application, council needs to make the decision is this protecting the asset of this community, or are we reducing zoning and downgrading this community? And we believe that the zoning that exists today uh, should be kept in place to enhance this community. I'd like to quickly correct a, a comment that Ms. Rose made as well on the existing what can be done in the property. It's only one to two units per acre with the existing zoning and general plan. So she kind of conveniently hit the general plan piece, but negated the zoning piece. It is one to two units as existing that can be built on this property, and that is what we want upheld by the Phoenix City Council. Uh, the last quick thing that I'll hit here is if you take a look at the proposal that was uh, presented here and just oppose those uh, lots on the top of the adjacent property, you'll notice that it takes six to nine of those units to equal one lot in the adjoining property. 
Uh, I didn't pick Camelback Farms to the south, which is actually two acre properties. We intentionally picked ones that are a representative sample of the overall community. So is this compatible in scale, design, and appearance per the general plan? We don't believe that it is. Uh, if you draw a line across there, they talk about how this is really a blend of these two, but the actual buildable land is really in that, again, one to two dwelling units per acre. And again, this is just looking at the general plan piece. The actual zoning requires one to two on all of it. There's a lot of other reasons for the zoning uh, uh, opposition by the neighborhood group, and one of those is that the density for this project has remained unchanged. I don't know what was in the pre-application that wasn't presented at the Maryville meeting, but what was presented at Maryville in every subsequent meeting since then was 207 units. I'm not sure if nobody on the uh, developer side read the file that you guys all have in front of you. There were numerous letters noting the density was, was the problem here. We were very clear throughout this process, density is the primary issue. We're trying to protect large acre lots that don't exist in the city of Phoenix. It's a density problem. With all due respect, John Cadis and the White Sox want the road. That's great. The residents don't care about the road. We care about density and protecting the asset of this community. That was always the ask, and that was a point that Ms. Rose was not willing to negotiate throughout this process, not only in the planning committee meetings that we went through, but also the five neighborhood meetings we attended to try to get to a compromise on this issue. Not a single one of those was that density reduced or proposed to be reduced. There's a lot of issues with the airport. You'll notice kind of the clever Glendale didn't make a recommendation one way or the other. They're certainly not supporting this development. If they were, they would have said that. Uh, I think there's a lot of concerns from the airport, but you know, I'm not an airport engineer. I'm not going to speak to those, but that's an example of some of the flight paths in and around this property. There's a lot of safety concerns in this area as well. So I want to close with what are our supported alternatives, because we're not anti-development. We're anti-development that enhances the community, which is done through one acre lots. And as was just proposed, we were even willing to compromise down to 150 units. It's not what the neighborhood wants, but we know a lot of parties have put in a lot of effort to this, and we want to try to make a fair compromise. Once again, Ms. Rose wasn't willing to reduce a single lot or come anywhere near that alternative proposal. We did that at the request of council when you guys continued the meeting last time. There's other uses outside of residential, I won't get into those, but the neighborhood is very supportive of commercial, agricultural use, um, something that's compatible with the sports area. So there's really a lot of options here. It doesn't have to be this plan that's in front of you. Again, we're not anti-development. We want development that enhances the community. And the very last point that I'd like to make, Ms. Rose noted in her presentation that 155 people signed in support of this development. I'd like to see any neighbors that supported this development to please stand. Interesting. I'd like to see any neighbors who are opposed to this development please stand. I think the community speaks for itself. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Uh, is there any questions or anything that anybody would like to ask? Thank you. Thank you. Bonnie Conrad? And Lisa Davis will follow. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor and committee members. I appreciate you uh, hearing from us and my neighbors. Um, the, our neighborhood, as Jeff stated, has continually stated that our main concern is density, and I'm totally against the general plan being changed. The general plan that the city council voted in states that the, uh, ex the anything built should be compatible with the existing neighborhood and to preserve open spaces. Our neighborhood is a very open neighborhood with lots that are two acre to half acre irrigated properties. And the, uh, it, the developer wants to build homes on much smaller lots that do not abut to our neighborhood and be compatible. Generally, if you taper land or, you know, rezone, you taper the zoning. And they're taking the zoning down to much smaller than any type of tapering from half acre down to like we were proposing and matching it with half acre lots so that it meets with our uh, development. 
our uh, community. And the um, proposals in that had been written up said that the development was sensitive to the scale and character of the surrounding neighborhood. We are the only surrounding neighborhood, and the developer's neighborhood is not sensitive to the scale and principles of design of our neighborhood. Our neighborhood is irrigated horse properties of large size, and our neighborhood is totally isolated from any of the other neighborhoods. To the east of us, there's a canal between us and the larger neighborhoods. To the north of us is what would be Bethany that will never be developed because it runs into the river bottom and is a flood control uh, road with flood control trail. To the, the west of us is the river bottom and to the south of us is Camelback. That's, there is none of the neighbors to the south or to the east that abut up to us that would uh, bring up the developer saying that these other neighborhoods are compatible and, and uh, you know, larger than, than the zoning. And I say that if, um, it, you know, the land is, a, is an isolated pie-shaped piece of property that totally affects our um, development. And if, if you do approve this, I would like to know that the developer is not, the, their HOA would not be complaining about our horses and our animals in our neighborhood, that we will be, they're putting this trail in supposedly because of our equestrian neighborhood, but their HOA will be main, maintaining it. So there should be a stipulation like they're doing for the airport that they'd be fined for noise complaint about the airport. They should be fined for any complaints against horses, manure, or animal sounds as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jack, did you want to go next or do you want Jennifer? Jennifer, please, Mayor. Okay. Jennifer, uh, and you have one card, so you have four minutes. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Um, I live at 1065 West Solano Drive, which is right in the large lot neighborhood. I moved in there six years ago. It's a beautiful neighborhood. It's what we were looking for. We have, I have a half acre. I've got one of the smallest lots on the property. It's a half acre. We're septic. We're, we have open property. We don't have divided lines. We don't have street signs. It's, I don't even have a street light on my property. There isn't one until two houses down. So you can actually stay in your backyard in the middle of the night and look up and see stars in Phoenix. Can you imagine that? It's different than any place else you can live. And that's what we're trying to, to match to our neighborhood. Um, it's, a, it's amazing that density thinks that it's a big issue. And you're like, well, what's 50 homes? And 50 homes in 60 acres is a huge difference, especially when you're looking at each of those homes will each have at least one or two cars. They're all going to be driving through our neighborhood. Even with the road being built, it's still not the same. That road goes up through and might attach to Westgate, but it doesn't actually relieve anything. If you're coming up Camelback, you're not gonna go up Ballpark Road to go to any place else, because all your shopping and everything, all your connection to the 101 is right there on Camelback. It's where people go. The only thing it relieves is for the teams. The teams wanted the road, the teams with $850,000 from Mad and Me and 150,000 the, from the teams is building a road so they can get this pushed through. And that's not what we want. We want it to match what we have. We want it to be the same. We have septic tanks. We're not on sooty sewer. We're on none of that. And it's 150 feet from the end of the airport to the closest home that's going to be built in this property. We know what airplane plane noise is. We actually had a small council meeting. We had to actually stop talking in our own homes because the airport noise is so loud at times. There's a couple that go over that sound like old Harley Davidson's driving through the air above your property. They're very loud. And we're a long ways off of where the airport takes on and comes off. So those are really big concerns for us. Um, and also in between the airport the air and our property that's going to be built, that's an FAA regulated air, uh, helicopter training zone that goes right over the wash. If you've ever sat right beside a helicopter in the middle of the night, um, you hear them going over the police copters, it's there all the time. So we want to make sure that 
those people that are going to move in there are going to sign a waiver that says, okay, I understand that there's an airport right next to me and I'm not allowed to complain because I knew about this when I moved in and we're going to build the houses so that they're more soundproof, but how often in the wintertime do you have all your windows closed and your door closed and you're living inside your house? You're going to reduce the, your enjoyment of your backyard because you're living less than 750 feet from where helicopters are training. It just doesn't make sense. It's not compatible with our neighborhood. And we don't think that it's, it's really that right to be able to say, okay, I'm going to get together, we're going to spend a million dollars for a property that's in Glendale. Of course, Phoenix isn't paying for it because the road's in Glendale. The road's not in Phoenix. So it wouldn't cost Phoenix taxpayer money anyway because it's not in Phoenix. So that is our standpoint. We really hope that you guys consider the general plan as it's written and keep the homes similar to ours so they match what we currently live in and what we want to see on the property next to us. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Jack Lunsford. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor Waring, members of the council. Um, this is obviously a very complex issue. Um, and we appreciate all of the work and the consideration, the conversation, the dialogue, going back and forth uh, uh, from, from Allen to staff, et cetera. Um, it's really, really important to at least have a feeling that there is a sentiment of concern for our neighborhood. You met the neighbors earlier. You've just heard about the passion um, from the neighbors, and that's important. But I want to talk about a couple of other things. What I'm about to say would be for the record whether it would be in court or not. It's, my, it's important to recognize that. I don't suffer falsehoods or selective memory very lightly. Um, I'm glad that Jordan put up that um, particular list. And somehow that particular list became equivalent to one of Moses' tablets. And there was never, ever any discussion beyond, well, I don't want to say never, ever. There was limited discussion beyond that, and that continues to be shown as somehow that that was our everything and our only thing. It was never a best and final. In my view, it was openers. I don't know, I, I trust that you all have been involved in negotiations at one time in your life or another. You walk into the conversation and you put something forward, but other things um, arise or evolve from those conversations, and then you have to either go back to your client or have a, or negotiate or or negotiate on the spot. So let me address number one that wasn't included. Number one on that list, and this is not density. I'll get to density in a second. Number one said nothing to be built vertical until Ballpark Boulevard is completed from its terminal point northeast to Maryland Avenue. That was our number one. Okay, um, Madam, he said we'll agree. Well, their response was, we'll speed up the um, construction of Ballpark Boulevard. Well, we never got a chance to say, is that good, bad, or indifferent, um, because all of a sudden we have an, uh, an agreement. Second, the easy things to agree to were the lot size is, at least from our vantage point, the lot size change and so on. We appreciate that they did that. Um, uh, and, and we're facing walls and all of that. It's kind of easy. Um, I, I didn't know, Mayor, that, that um, I was going to be as limited because I have a lot of members. Um, yeah, 20 minutes and 20 minutes. It's even. So can you, would you um, help me understand how long we are? I, I'll have to ask the people to tell me how much. Pardon me? Five more minutes. Five more minutes. I'll go so very quick. if you're doing it, then you're using... The people that are left time. Um, I believe they're all going to yield, Mayor. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, so, so I'll go quickly. We asked for none of those 19 lots, or excuse me, all of those late, uh, lots to be 19 along 107th Avenue. Somehow they got changed to 100 or to 16 lots um, during that period of time. And we asked, even as recently as last week, to restore it to, to 19, and, and the response was, well, the neighbors want that. Our neighborhood doesn't want that, but that's what, that's what would be beneficial um, to their community. So moving quickly, um, uh, 
One of those was key. No more than 30% of the homes in the development are to be two stories. Pretty straightforward. The response was, we agree that at least 20% of the homes will be limited to single story. Turn that around. We said 30% um, two story and 70% one story. The response was 80% two story and 20% single story. And that's now in the stipulation number 22. Um, the comment was made about no short-term rentals. Our statement says stipulate no rentals allowed, period. And our neighbors were very strong on that. Um, so I'll turn to density. It's been density, density, density all along. Um, any comment about going from uh, uh, 3.4 to 3.2 units per the acre is somewhat of an ob obfuscation because as Jeff O'Toole said, it's been 207. It's never changed. Um, to Jeff's point, we originally had been at um, two to the acre, um, and we've moved up. Um, and we moved up to 150 units. Um, and we think that that's doable, um, and, and we appreciate uh, your um, uh, support um, on, on acno or your acknowledgement, excuse me, on that. So you have seen um, what I have distributed to you um, and I can challenge about a dozen things that were just put up on there that were, were a stretch, if by anything, but time will not allow me to do that, uh, unfortunately. So let me just again reaffirm density. Um, the road has never been our first priority. We supported the road with John Cadis early on. We met with most of you under that, those situations. And we never, ever supported that as our number one priority. And to characterize that as such is absolutely incorrect. Um, our number one priority has been density all along. Um, so lastly, I'll end with this. Um, they've continually said we've given them everything they want. If you go down our list, it's the easy stuff. It's nice to be able to give that. They haven't given us the hard stuff. And what they did give us is what they want. And that just doesn't seem right to, um, to me. I come from a really long, experienced time of negotiation. And this doesn't come close to negotiations. Mayor and council, the neighborhood strongly urges you to oppose the general plan of amendment and the zoning request. Happy to answer any questions. I have one quick question. You mentioned something on 107th and the density going, or the, the lots going from 19 to 16. And uh, because of the, the line site and, and what from a lot of the neighbors were talking about, it's not consistent with the neighborhood. Uh, I think logically people would assume that you'd want less lots. You're saying that you would want, you'd want it back to 19, not 16 or lower. We, uh, um, uh, Madam Mayor and, and Councilman Valenzuela, we originally asked for 19. Um, it, somehow it was changed without cons consultation with us to make it 16. And even when we brought it up again, um, as recently as last week, we were saying, no, we don't want that to be the number. We want it to be 19 all the way across. So it's illustrative of how things changed without concurrence from us. Did I answer your question? You did. I, I was just curious because I would imagine you'd want less units on that line site, uh, to but but you'd want. It sounds like 19. 19. Well, if if there's sort of I don't. If you'd like to fill out a card, well, I don't. I don't want to take the. I was curious, Jack. I was just curious because you you mentioned that it was at 19. Then right off the, of my sheet, sir. Right, then it went to 16 without consulting you. But, uh, and logically, I would think that you'd want less there on the line side because of the, the types of homes that, that you are representing. And, uh, but you're, I just wanted to set the record, you wanted to go back up to 19. So, Madam Mayor. The, the reason why the neighborhood opposes the 16 homes is because it lines up with our little roads that go through our community. 
And so we don't want roads to punch through eventually from the community mm -hmm. onto 107, which is our protected one way, one way in, one way out of our neighborhood. Gotcha. So they line up exactly with where our roads are. So that's a, why we don't want them there. Could we put a map up to kind of follow this, this um, of the area? Thank you. And if I can, Mayor and, and Councilman Valenzuela, um, uh, we also asked for uh, no two stories along 107th Avenue, and magically, it became half. Gotcha. Um, so uh, to Jennifer's point, um, and I appreciate her uh, stepping in to, to make that, it, you can, uh, I don't have the clicker, but Alan does, so he can, uh, he can point to the, yeah, right there, is, is that um, open area that was, that was created um, uh, after we put forward the number we wanted and, and it got changed. And you've heard that, um, uh, that we don't want that. And literally, um, as recent as a week ago, five neighbors in a small group meeting selected by the neighbors met with Mattamy Homes and expressed it again. Thank you, sir. Uh, how much time does the applicant have left? Zero? She used it all? Pardon me? Right. And she used her whole 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, I thought you said seven minutes when I stopped. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're not my people. Those are cities. Those aren't my people. Mm. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. She's explaining. Just sit out. Oh. No, they were just in support. There's a difference. Okay, so she now has seven minutes. A little confusing. You're going to be in trouble. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. This is a new process. So I, <laughs> I, appre I, I very much cool. appreciate it. And if, if you might just pull up my end of my presentation, I just have a couple slides. I wanted to address a couple things that some of the neighbors said so that we're clear. Um, we were handed a list that when we were handed it, we were handed it in front of the chair of the Planning Commission, and they said these are the things that it will take to get us over the finish line. Density wasn't in that. We thought that issue had been put to rest given the fact that our density, our zoning density is the same under the general plan as what is permitted today. Um, but some of the other things that would be helpful for you to know, um, we are, we appreciated the, some of the comments. Um, we're happy to put um, in our CCNRs, and you could stipulate to dark sky ordinance um, in this community, and we're happy with that. We'll also stipulate to the same type of remedy we gave the airport with any horse complaints, if anybody complains about horses um, or the agricultural uses that are going on there, and we're happy to stipulate to that in our CCNRs. We'll put that in there. Um, I also wanted to note that the village, I was not representing Madame at the time, but I was just told by a representative who was there, they were opposed because there was no northern access. That's the reason. We fixed that. That's what we fixed. Everything has happened since then. Um, and someone said that Glendale opposes this or is not supportive, and that's far from the case. You heard Glendale testify. And in fact, Mayor Wires just a few days ago said that the airplanes don't fly over this property. He's a pilot. They fly over the residential R35 property, but not this property. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to, to show you, um, let's see. Um, this, I, and this is just sort of how the residents, th there's dead ends all over here. The No cars can really go through their property. Um, and, and just mentioned that Metamine negotiated in good faith. Um, they attempt to fill all of those requests. Uh, the market research, they do tons of market research. It's just not possible to make 150, 190 lots work at two to the acre. It's just not. This is a much better plan. There's no access on 107th Avenue. These residential neighbors are not going to notice that these people are there because they're not driving down their streets. The home rice price range, just so they know, and I think it's important, is gonna be between starting at 260 to $400,000. So this is not a diminishment in their value. And we looked on MLS and the large lots in that area are selling 43% longer time period than the smaller lots. So it's not that there's some market that Mattamy is missing. 
Um, they lowered the density to th what the neighbors know is approved right now under the general plan. Um, there's no access on 107th. There's a large buffer with an equestrian trail that our neighbors are not using. That's for them and we're maintaining it. And frankly, I think this is really how zoning cases are supposed to go, where you work with interested parties. We, we did that in good faith. We were giving something and we, we literally did take it as a tablet of this is what we need to do. And it wasn't easy. $850,000 for a road you don't impact is not easy. Equestrian trail for equestrians when we don't have any equestrians, not easy. Making a groundbreaking agreement with an airport, not easy. We had lots of opposition. And those ball teams, John Cadis, not easy, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding, John. But in any case, and then all the neighbors to the south who are really supportive of this global effort by the city of Phoenix, not costing your taxpayers one dime. And I know that um, they would appreciate your support today, too. So thank you. And I'd take any questions. I appreciate the time that you've given all of us. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Comments? Motions? Okay. I don't have questions for Councilwoman Pastor? I have questions for you, but I think we have to close the hearing. Oh, yeah. Meetings, hearings closed. Sorry, go ahead. So, Ellen, one of the champions of the general plan, I was given that duty and assignment. Um, and one of my uh, pet peeves about the general plan, just as in general, in the sense of being a uh, participant and sitting on a village, is that we do a general plan and we engage community and we have them participate in all the elements of the general plan for their areas um, in order to embrace uh, the area that they live in, but also to uh, keep uh, the, so in my area the historic value, but in other areas it's obviously the equestrian. I keep hearing about the general plan. Can you please explain to me and give me um, some, uh, enlighten me as to there's two different narratives regarding the general plan one from the neighbors and one from the developers. So please guide me in this area. Thank you, Mayor. Councilwoman uh, Pastor, um, we'll, we'll pull up the PowerPoint. There's two components of the general plan. So there's the land use map. Uh, that's what you see that is requesting to be changed uh, as part of that. And we will um, go back and, and pull up that general plan uh, slide to show you how the land use designations are impacted. The other part of the, that the uh, neighbors are bringing up is some of the larger general plan goals and language. And so the general plan land use designation has been on that parcel since 1985. And that parcel shows that's the little bottom triangle piece there that shows it uh, 3.5 to 5 dwelling units per acre. And then the other uh, portion of that is residential 1 to 2. Uh, you can see right here, which is that lighter yellow color. And so that has been the land use designation on this parcel since 1985. You can see that um, the area where Camelback Ranch uh, sits today uh, is still shown as residential. And that was because when the special permit zoning case came forward for Camelback Ranch, the intent was uh, to rezone those parcels in the back for commercial resort and retail uses that were going to uh, support the, uh, the Camelback Ranch development. So they were gonna do a general plan amendment and a larger zoning case, but because of the downturn in the economy, they never brought that forward. The parcel went into receivership and uh, has really been marketed since that time. It's only come forward with residential uses in that time frame. The, the big picture general plan that you're familiar with, and thank you for being the, the chair of the, the general plan election uh, you know, committee as that went forward, really talks about how the council and the community should look at zoning cases as they come forward. So there's lots of language that talks about compatibility, but there's also language that talks about how do you promote economic development opportunities? How do you balance property rights uh, with different types of land use activities where you have an airport on one side, you have commercial uh, to the south, and you have large lot residential. 
Uh, many of you know that you've been around for a while. When you see zoning cases come forward, we don't typically see very large lot zoning cases, and that's because the city requires a level of infrastructure that is much more expensive to do. The stuff that you see uh, that is typical of, you know, across 107th here, and some of the stuff you see in, in County Islands area, they don't have the, the requirements for water and sewer. They don't have the requirements for curb and gutter and sidewalk. Those things develop in uh, lots of times in a county fashion and then are annexed into the city later on. When you try and develop in the city of Phoenix, we have much more stringent requirements so the city doesn't have to go in and pay to put some of those things in. In order to do that, you have to balance that general plan goal where it talks about compatibility with economic development and other impacts that are on the city's budget so that the city doesn't have to go in and provide and do any of those things in the future. We make the private sector do as part of their development today. That answers your questions. I'm, I'm happy to elaborate further if you'd like. It does answer my question. So uh, now regarding this case, so, please explain to me where there is uh, different interpretations of the general plan. So, so the, the general plan designation, uh, as you see here, if you add up the acreage on the top of this map, it shows you that the 3.5 to 5 dwelling units per acre is almost 25 acres. The residential one to two is about a little over 41 acres of this entire site. If you were to max out the density of those two categories, i.e. build five dwelling units per acre on the part that is the 20, almost 25 acres, and then two on the other part, you could get up to 207, 208 homes, uh, depending on how that's really round up. That's where Ms. Rose is saying they're consistent with the general plan because they're spreading those out across the whole parcel instead of putting them in, in one area. What the neighbors are contending is that the zoning uh, for this site is um, S1, and that allows you one dwelling unit per acre, and the bulk of the site, even on the general plan, is that one to two, which is the 41, that light yellow color, and the smaller portion is that two to five. Okay, so I have recent history here. <clears throat> and uh, Z1-31-13 asked for 224 lots. Um, I feel like this case comes, re keeps recurring and, uh, and it all ends up on the density. Um, then that got denied. Um, Z1-115-14 was 190 lots, and that got denied. Z1-7-18 is 207. Those are the three that have been before us, I want to say. So, Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, those, um, those cases, the Z7-18 is the current case, uh, and so the other two cases did not actually come before council. They were withdrawn. Uh, prior to getting there, but there was um, opposition from council as those cases approached there. I think one of the, the key differences uh, between this case and those ones is those ones still had opposition uh, from uh, the teams and from the city of Glendale because they weren't addressing traffic issues. So in addition to the concerns of the neighborhood, you had those other two groups that had concerns as well. And so what Madame A. Holmes was uh, proposing to do is try and address the concerns relative to Ballpark Boulevard so that they can direct all of their traffic to Ballpark Boulevard, where those other projects, they had at, uh, at least initially looked at having some access to 107th Avenue. So part of Madame A's solution is we will not have any traffic impact to 107th, we will work on getting agreements to do Ballpark Boulevard so all the traffic goes there. And uh, in doing that, that's one of the key differences between this project and the other ones. Thank you for that. Um, when I had a meeting, I want to say two weeks ago, three weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, all my weeks are running now. Um, and I had a meeting with uh, Jack Lunsford and John Cadis. In that meeting, it was our first vote and uh, the request was, please, uh, please vote no on this case. Um, 
due to the fact that all the pieces are not here together. They're not, they're not one yet. During that time, that's when a continuance came about. Then I got a call from uh, the city of Glendale saying, hey, we're in agreement, da 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 I said, yes, but the two people that came to my office, one is in agreement and one is not. And when they left my office, I said, please come back, and the both of you come back in agreement, thinking that the two are working together and the two would stick together in the sense of being able to work the dynamics out as a collective. So what I really struggle with, and this is something uh, for the developer, is the density piece, because the density is the, is the sticking point. And so I would like to know where that conversation, uh, who did you have a conversation with in the neighborhood regarding the density piece. So I don't know who to ask this question to. I don't know if Alan, you know, because sometimes you're in the middle of all this. So. Mayor, Councilman Pastor, I would, would let uh, Ms. Rose and Mr. Uh, Lunsford ask those, answer those questions. I was aware that they had a meeting, uh, but they wanted to do that separately last week. Um, so I'll let them talk about exactly what happened in that. Uh, Mayor and, and Councilwoman Pastor, um, the day that you adjourned, we started emailing Mr. Lunsford, and I think I drove him crazy. I emailed him every day, can we meet, can we meet? And his group, um, you know, is, is multiple people, so he could meet um, last Thursday. So when we arrived at that meeting, um, they said exactly what they said today, which is those things on that paper are not as consequential as the two to the acre, and that's what we want. So that's, there is there is no ability to, to provide two to the acre and then do all of those things that we've agreed to do, which were key um, to all of the past cases that you cite. Those were some of the issues on access on 107th and Ballpark Boulevard being extended. And so um, I think we've done what we can, and we're certainly happy to, um, you know, we, we want to build a quality community there's no access on 107th, and so the density issue, because those, those lots along 107th are gonna be at least 18,000 square feet, the density issue is, is not gonna be noticeable to these neighbors um, in, in, in any traffic sort of way, because there will be no traffic on their street. There's just no reason to go on their street. Nobody can get in. It's just for emergency responders to get out. So that was where we didn't understand, and I, I don't actually understand when they testify that they want less lots, but yet they want more lots along 107th. And that's the kind of thing we've been dealing with. I mean, I have dozens of emails like, hey, can we meet? Can we do this? Whatever. And I, I don't know how that works when we're saying, the question was, we reduced the lots on 107th because we thought, they've been saying we want them to be more like the lots across the street, and then today he testifies he wants more lots because he's concerned, they're concerned that our, in the future we could pop roads out from that, and maybe your planning director can, because obviously the trust between me and them, I'm not advising them, but maybe the planning director could comment on how we can't do that. If we stipulated, for example, to 16 lots, we can never, we can't change that without coming back. We're not going to be able to put streets, you know, in and that kind of thing. And I think that's a, a big, big issue, confusion issue. Please, I, I, I would like to hear, I'm curious as well. I'd like to hear, I'm curious about that topic. So Ellen, if you can explain that. Sure, mayor, members of council, uh, the development is stipulated uh, to have no access to 107th Avenue except for uh, emergency vehicles only. That would be the permanent condition. They are allowed to have some residential vehicle access until Ballpark Boulevard is constructed. So uh, because they are advancing that forward, if they go, if this project's approved, they will be selling homes. There may be a time period when they're selling some homes, but it would, but Ballpark Boulevard would not be done. But once it's done, then they would get access, then they would have access all through 
uh, Ballpark Boulevard and none on 107th Avenue as part of the permanent condition. And, and so I should add that's only on game days. We're only allowed to have that access before <laughs> Ballpark Boulevard is built on game days, and that's it. And that's in our development agreement. Too. That's correct. And there, uh, as part of the the stipulations, if a council approves it, they would not be allowed to convert one of those open space areas to have access in the future without going through some type of public hearing process um, because it's stipulated to provide no access. How do you enforce that? Uh, two ways, I mean, Mayor, Council Pastor. So it, one is, a, is a, um, a stipulation that goes on the site plan. So when they come in for their site plan review, they are stipulated as part of that uh, that they have to be, maintain their development in conformance with that site plan that shows no access to that. So you can't just uh, you know legally drive across uh, improved open space for your development. So if they wanted to do that, they would have to come in and get permits to change the curb and gutter, sidewalk, do all that stuff, at which time we would say, no, you have a stipulation that says you can't have access to that. You've got to go back through the public hearing process in order to modify that stipulation. So member, just to note, we are going to be building a site wall along there. So we would actually, that that's incompatible with the site wall that we'll, we'll spend a lot of you know, money on making look beautiful. And then we're going to be building out the curb or the, the sidewalk, the ADA sidewalk on 107th that's required. So it would just make, plus we'll have configured all our lots and drainage. So it would make absolutely no sense for us to come back and ask for and I don't want to be, they don't want to be standing here again asking for access onto 107th. I mean, that's, that's not going to occur. So I appreciate the explanation from Alan that it can't. <laughs> oh, sorry. So, so uh, Mr. Lund, sir, I, I definitely want to hear what you have to say. But okay. while we're here, hearing her, the planning director's explanation of, uh, of that particular stipulation for, to bring it from 19 to 16, would you still say you'd want it back to 19 or, or uh, th does, is it a better idea to have less? You know, uh, Mayor and Councilman Valenzuela, I think we're, we're focusing on something that isn't the core of the issue. I understand okay. that, sir, but I'm still and, asking the question yeah, and because I, I, I find myself in a position where I have to do nego the negotiating because I don't see this happening. And, and it's unfortunate, it's a little frustrating, but, but I, I'm trying to, to find a solution because I don't think, uh, I don't think it's gonna happen by itself, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I appreciate that very much, um, Councilman. Um, Mayor and, and members, um, so, so if, if that tends to be the hang up and it's 16 to 19, I think we'll be fine at 16, okay? But I want to go back to the core question, if I may, Perfect. Councilman Valenzuela, that, that Councilwoman Pastor asked, um, which, wh what were the discussions on density? Um, I will remind the council that at every planning and zoning commission, this, this group raised concern, as did I, about density. And indeed, one of the commissioners sitting right up there asked the neighbors to choose between, if they had to choose between completion of the road and better density, which would they choose? And it was unanimous sitting out here, as it would be today, that they would choose improved density. Um, when we met last week during the conversation, and yes, there was conversation about two to the acre, I said to Jordan, I said, you know what, Jordan, and I'm going to quote this as best I can. You know, I haven't talked to the neighbors yet, but I'll bet you right now that we could have a conversation and, and get to about 150-ish an acre somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, and I said, but I need to talk to the neighbors. Five neighbors said yes before I could finish. An another neighbor said, is inside, what about 130? But the fact of the matter is, I, I have spoken with many of you, with a member, the leader of the neighborhood, who has committed to the 150 um, and, and agreed on all of the other um, uh, stipulations that are there. And then I contacted Jordan and I said that was the same thing and she said she didn't recall. And I said, I have to tell you, I, that, that may be selective, but I'm gonna stand because um, for a neighborhood that as um, Councilwoman Pastor 
alluded to that has gone through several iterations of this and it's revolved around density and has been no, to move to 150 is significant. So, wait, 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 you had your turn. Excuse me, with all due respect. So what I find, um, I find what the stickler is, is obviously density. And density has been the stickler for the last two. So I find it very interesting that the two cannot come together and work out at least or, or have a civil conversation regarding density. But uh, you've answered all my questions. Any further questions? I don't hear any. Governor Marshall? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I I'm, I'm, came into this meeting, this is a, uh, always, these are always the hardest cases. You know, the, the, these are neighborhood cases, they're zoning cases, uh, and they're very personal, I think, to every council member uh, because they're, they're, in our, they're in council districts. They're in places that we live in where we have uh, neighbors and family members and, and so on, uh, friends. And I happen to know that personally the speakers that spoke today uh, from, from the neighborhood, people I, I care about. I, uh, I'm a little, uh, I'm a little concerned that uh, after all of this time, uh, I, I, I do think that there are a lot of, a lot of advancements that were made, but somewhere along the line, there was obviously a, a, a block wall that was, that was hit and it, it seemed like the communication stopped. And, and, uh, you know, the, 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 de the density issue, uh, I understand Ms. Rose uh, mentioned that before she took this project, uh, the project started, I believe, at 221 in the, uh, and um, came down to 207. There is no movement. There's zero movement from 207. Um, it's almost a conversation that you know, can't, can't be had or can't be touched. And in talking with the community, uh, and it was mentioned today, uh, the density is somewhere around 150, 160 ish, without throwing a number out there. Uh, and and there is no uh, there's no movement there. So so how do we how do we get there? It's the fifth largest city in the country. It continues to grow. I know the area very well. I, I lived for many many years in, in that community. I raised my kids in that. Uh, in that area, uh, I know that there are some needs in the community. I know that uh, the neighbors are constantly talking about bringing jobs to the community. Uh, we want high paying jobs in the community. Uh, in order to do that, we have to invest in infrastructure and education, and, uh, and you, it's hard to, to get one without the other. We have some great infrastructure with the 101 uh, before my time in office, ballpark, uh, came along, and uh, and I, I think that's a that's a good thing, uh, but there are a lot of uh, there are some traffic issues in the area that I think are being ignored today. But I know that there are traffic issues in the area because again I lived for many years in the area, and so uh, I, I think there have been some compromises made. But as I'm sitting here and I'm listening to this and I'm hearing no movement. I'm, I'm jotting down notes of what uh, I think are going to uh, become my, my motion. And I have a feeling I'm not gonna make anyone happy uh, with, with this motion. And, uh, and I, hope I, I hope I do, but uh, I, I wanna do the responsible thing by, by the city. Again, it's a growing community. It's a growing area. There's some great homes. These are great homes that we're talking. I'm talking about the homes that are currently there. And how do we preserve that particular neighborhood while continuing to, to, uh, to grow the area? And, and that's always a tough question, and that's been a, a question that's had to be answered by council, councils throughout this city, for this city, throughout the years as the city continues to grow. So. 
so that said, you know, how, how do we create a, a motion, a potential vote here that preserves the current neighborhood that we're talking about, uh, making some adjustments to the, to the general plan. I do realize that this did not pass the Maryville Village Planning Committee that I once sat on, and I believe is an important committee. It eventually passed, passed the, uh, the Planning Commission. It didn't pass the Maryville Village Planning Committee after doing my research, uh, minutes, notes, that kind of thing. A lot of these stipulations that have been added were not presented when this case went before the, the Maryville Village Planning Committee. Is that correct, Alan? Mayor Council Valenzuela, that's correct. They did add a number of stipulations since the village. There are some, some good things that have been proposed today. The uh, minimum of 15% open space. It's important to note that's three times more than the surrounding areas. And Ellen, please correct me if I'm wrong here. A uh, 50 foot landscape common area along the west side or the west side of, of uh, 107th Avenue to serve as a buffer. 10 foot multi use trail along the west side of 107th Avenue and south property line. Restrictions on vehicular uh, access to 107th Avenue. I understand that that is a private road, it should remain a private road, but that's been another issue and why this particular, well, not this particular project, but other projects have, have failed in the past. There hasn't been an answer for, uh, you know, how we get first responders in and out should there be an emergency. I think that's a good compromise to have a, a, a gate there and where you have fire department and police access. Um, there are some things that I want to ask for in the motion. And again, you know, th this is, this is just by listening because there hasn't been much movement on things like density or anything else. But to, to further, uh, what I want to do here, I want to further reduce the number of lots adjacent to 107th Avenue. I think with Ellen's explanation, I think fewer lots is better for 107th Avenue. I think it protects that unique neighborhood. I don't think more lots will do that. Moving from uh, 19 to 16 is good. What I'm gonna ask for is 11 lots uh, on 107th Avenue. If you did the math here, that means those lots will be 20,000 square feet. They're moving from 18,000 square feet. Bear with me here. I want to ask staff to have the Planning Commission initiate the general plan amendment to the street classification map that will reclassify 107th Avenue from a minor collector to a local street. My motion is to approve per the memo from the Planning Com uh, and Development Director dated June 27th, 2018 and adopt the related ordinance with modifications to the following stipulations in the memo. I want to start with the dark skies lighting. I would also like the, to add a stipulation around the animals, agriculture, animal sounds, manure, flies, flies. <laughs> I mean, the, the, so I, I don't have a horse, right? But, but I believe those with horse property who have horses, they, I think there was a great point that was made. If we're going to add the stipulations as it pertains to the airport, we need to do the same thing to protect this particular neighborhood. So I see you writing d something down, Alan. I just want to be sure that, that, you, that I'm making it very clear what will be in this motion. Uh, I also would like to add uh, and modify stipulation 21 to require all lots adjacent to 107th Avenue be a minimum of 20,000 square feet. That's 11 lots. Modify stipulation number 22 to require that all homes along 107th Avenue, not 50%, but all homes, shall be limited to one story and 20 feet high. 
uh, stipulation 24 speaks to the 11 lots on 107th Avenue. I also, uh, there is a, within 200 feet, but the, the homes behind this row of uh, 11, I think there, there, there's a stipulation that speaks that 30% needs to be uh, single story. Mayor, uh, Council Valenzuela, the current stipulation reads 30% is stipulation number 22. It sounds like you're wanting to increase that to uh, do, 50%. Right, which is, so that, that will go to 50%. And, and so again, making it very clear that the 11 homes on 107th Avenue are single story. Correct, uh, right. Mayor Councilman Bounsway. I think you're, the 11 lots that abut will all be single story. Beyond that is the 50%. area within that 200 feet. Within where the 200 the, feet. The first row of right. homes uh, that will then be stipulated to a maximum of 50% of those being two story. There'll be additional direction to staff to initiate a general plan amendment to reclassify 107th Avenue north of Camelback Road from a minor collector to a local street on the street classification map and 107th Avenue should not connect north of the SRP canal in the future. One more very important stipulation, uh, and that's number six, and that's to move the density down to 199 to get it under 200. I believe that completes the motion. Second. I guess my question is, does the applicant accept that? Uh, Mayor and, and Councilman, um, yes. Okay, now does the neighborhood accept that? So, um, Mayor, and uh, I want to thank uh, Councilman Valenzuela um, for trying to work through this process. As he said earlier, uh, probably nobody's going to be happy. Um, I can certainly feel strongly that the neighborhood will not be happy. Um, about it, um, but um, given that uh, there's a possibility that this could be approved, um, you know, um, we have to take what it is, but um, uh, we would much more prefer density at a lower level. I understand. Mayor? It's Alan. Before we uh, vote on this one? I, th <laughs> I, I thought it was Charlie from Charlie's Angels. Uh, it was an empty chair at the end. We do need to, to vote on the general plan amendment first. Okay. So, so the stipulations that Council Valenzuela read in the record as part of his motion would get attached to the zoning case 86. item. But first, we need to, to do item 85, which would be the general plan amendment, and then Council can move I think per that motion, I don't think we need to go through that again, but since we got it out and we got a second, I wanted to let that happen so then we could adjust the, the general plan and go back to what we need to do first. Okay, so we need uh, 85 motion first for general plan. <coughs> uh, Alan, while we're getting there, the question about the general plan and that motion, that is specifically to that area, not throughout the whole general plan, or what does uh, that mean? Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, <laughs> it is because uh, the current uh, general plan has a component of it called the street classification <coughs> map. That street classification map uh, classifies 107th Avenue, which is underneath this blue line, as a minor collector street because it is meant to collect traffic from this property, from this property, and then distribute it to the north and go down to Camelback. Uh, what the councilman is directing staff to do is make that a local street so that it only is serving this uh, rural larger lot neighborhood here and protect their lifestyle in that fashion. And then Ballpark Boulevard would be added to the street class map and traffic in this north-south uh, direction that would have went on 107th because that's the normal um, you know, mile street would now be going on ballpark and bypassing this neighborhood to protect that lifestyle there. It's only specific to this site. So it's improving the lifestyle. 
yeah, it, it's supporting their lifestyle by taking well, yeah. any traffic in the future that may have gone through there and saying, we want that to be a dead end. We don't want it to go north and just serve the local residents there only. Item 85, my motion is to approve per the Planning Commission recommendation and adopt the related resolution. Second. 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 Roll call. <clears throat> Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. Seven two. No, seven, can't possibly be. Seven zero. Seven, seven zero. Okay, Sorry. seven zero. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that bad at math. Alan's voice doesn't count as a vote. <laughs> Wake <Yeah>. up. <laughs> Next motion. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, you don't think you yeah. have to repeat the okay, whole thing, thank you. just kind of... I think my motion is on the record. What was that? Does that... <laughs> Jim, come on. Mayor, Council Bounds, well, if, if I can... Do you have 199? And adopt it. Yeah. I would like to... My motion is to adopt the related ordinance. And I would like to just clarify for the record that the city doesn't have a, a dark sky ordinance that you can just make reference to, <clears> but <throat> what we will do is make sure that the residential development has a minimum uh, light standards that are necessary, uh, you know, with inside that development from street lights, so that we address uh, the the typical concerns that come out of that. Yes, you know the dark, dark sky woman, the Kelvins, and everything else that I have studied. Correct. We, we will, as it relates to street lights, we will will make that happen. I just want it clear that. There isn't something that controls <laughs> someone's porch light relative to some dark sky ordinance. We're talking about street lights in the development. Correct, but can you uh, figure out that language so it's in there? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, I, pre I agree. So that's, that's the motion. Are we ready for roll call? Any other comments? Hearing none, roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Pastor. Yeah. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. I need to explain my vote because I, as legal, I do not have a conflict, but my son lives in that neighborhood, so I'm very familiar with it, and I know how unhappy they've been, and I am so protective of these types of property that have the horses because they are not always compatible with the other area, so I'm not supporting the motion. No. One. It passes, yes, six one. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to continue items nine and thirty four until the July fifth meeting. Yes. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, I have a motion to continue these items. I have some cards. You may speak if you want to continue. Leonard Clark. Thank you, Mayor and Council Member. Uh, I believe this item was the item on uh, the uh, lobbying fees. Yes, okay, really and this is just essentially to say, hey, we want to just continue this later, or are you guys debating it today? No, to continue. A week. Okay, then I will just hold off and wait till the next time. Thank okay, you. Uh, Blaine Light. Uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, Council Members, um, for the opportunity to speak about the dockless uh, bike share ordinance. Uh, no, this is to the continuance. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm talking about item number 34. It's being continued. So <laughs> are you talking, speaking about the continuance? I'm sorry, can you clarify? It's okay, the motion is to continue this item to the July 5th uh, agenda. So you may say uh, yes or no that you agree with that. Um, is it okay if I give a quick comment or should we wait until July 5th? Is July that the question? 5th. Okay. Yeah, you have to but really you could comment if you were unavailable on July 5th, you could say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that will be fine to make it on July 5th. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sean Severin? Yeah. 
No comment? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously, which would be 7 to 0. Ready? Moved, moved to approve item 10. Second. Second. We have one card, Leonard. Leonard Clark, would you like to come up and speak on item 10? My card was on item 35. We're on item 10. Oh, okay. 10. Blue, That's come right. on, we're on 10. Leonard, did you just run away? <laughs> Leonard, where are you? He doesn't need to speak. I'm taking it, so roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. Move approval of item 31, reappointment of judges. Second. Mayor, may I make a comment? Yes, you may. Uh, this <laughs> item includes reappointing our uh, chief presiding judge, Judge Taylor, and I just wanna thank him and, and our courts for their great work. I have had the pleasure particularly of working with him on our compliance assistance program, which is a program that helps uh, in particular lower income individuals who've struggled to pay their fines and fees. And it's uh, been, when we both arrived here, it was some people were really struggling. They were unable to pay their fines and fees and we kept taking on more fines and taking away their driver's licenses and if they couldn't pay their fines and fees when they had their driver's license, uh, it got even harder when they didn't. And I just wanna thank the judge and the court system for his leadership on that program. It has now almost 30,000 participants and has also benefited the taxpayer, bringing in more than $16 million. But the money that comes in directly to the city is just a drop in the bucket of the real financial impact. The ASU Seedman Institute did a study about the program and found that it has huge benefits to our residents. 53% uh, of the CAP participants obtained a new job as a direct consequence of their license reinstatement. That and other benefits mean that the program has generated about 150 million in economic impact. So huge success for Judge Taylor. Thank you so much for your leadership and making Phoenix a little bit more fair. I look forward to supporting this item. Any other comments? Mayor. Councilman. I'd also like to thank um, Councilmember uh, Gallegos for her leadership on this program. It's a program that really helps us with our AR, our account receivables, and gives that opportunity for those individuals that have to use their vehicles to drive to work to become good citizens. So, um, Kate, thank you for your hard work and your leadership in making this happen. Anyone else? We do have one card, Leonard Clark. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I have had ex uh, personal experience in your traffic courts. And uh, yes, so I would like to say that I, what I've seen in the conduct of our magistrates and how they're doing their jobs. Uh, I've been very impressed. Uh, they're very flexible on payment plans. So I have personal experience on that so far. Keep it up. Just keep the dungeons away and hopefully, you know, keep reappointing good magistrates like you're doing now, this chief judge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hearing no further comments, uh, roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Uh, Mayor, permission to explain my vote very briefly. I'll be voting no. It has no, this is not a reflection on the judge's capabilities or the job he's doing or anything else. I've had issues that I've articulated in the past about, uh, about salary. Uh, so I apologize in advance. No. Yes. I believe that's uh, six, six months. 32 is a public hearing on the proposed annexation, 107th Avenue and Broadway Road. I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any cards? Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak on this? Hearing no one, I will close the meeting. No action today. Uh, takes us to item 35. Move to approve item 35. Second. Comments? 
<coughs> Oops, card. Uh, blue. When I first saw this, I thought it was uh, going to be a stop on Thomas and 59th, and there's already one there on the south east side. And then I figured out, no, it's on 59th Avenue. We're going to be doing it. And I started doing some of the math. Right now, even though Prop 400 passed, what, 12 years ago, 30% of the stops in the city of Phoenix are just a sign. And uh, I find that highly inadequate, isn't what a, a major metropolitan area should be doing, especially since, you know, it was 110 today. If you're at a bus stop with just a sign, you're not standing in 110 degrees because 110 is the ambient air temperature in the shade. So if you're at a bus stop and there is no shaded shelter, you're uh, exposed to what, 140? In fact, they said the UV index today was nine minutes. So any of you white folks up there that would have been out there, you already got a burn, and that's a part of uh, your health being compromised. So when I look at, as I said, that budget that you guys passed over there at the RPTA saying that you needed to have $17 million put away for future rail use. And they have their own funding. There's rail funding. And this was coming out of us. And what is that 17 million for? Why can't you do some bus stops? 10,000 a piece, put some cover out there and have a better attitude. And instead of your attitude of respect the ride, start respecting the rider. And also I find it, uh, Fascinating that at that RPTA meeting where it was shown that you cannot go anywhere in the system and stop at those stops, then why do you have art at every one of them? Why can't the people appreciate Thank you, it? Thank you. Uh, any further comments? Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. <clears throat> yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes, seven to zero. Mayor, I move to approve item 38. We have a motion and a second. Leonard Clark. Thank you, Mayor and Council members. Yes, my name is Leonard Clark. I'm from Phoenix. I am just concerned in light of the Fourth Amendment completely almost being eroded away that this proposition, which I feel is germane to speak on the Fourth Amendment, is going to uh, approve, I guess, spying equipment, tracking devices. Um, and I'm not one of these people that hate the police or worship them. They have a tough job to do. And they do die in line of duty protecting me and my family. That happens sometimes, OK? So this is not against the individuals. My problem as a civil libertarian is you are going to appropriate, and you can correct me, I believe it's approximately or $308,000 for spying devices. And I know our police force is not nearly as big as New York City, which is really like a mini army. But in this day and age, when our Constitution is under threat, our Fourth Amendment right to privacy, I'm just concerned, no offense against you, but any potential or future, or future council members you know, working with police could be spying on their enemies. We already know you have many cameras. I've been at these appropriation meetings on our city street lights. You know, I'm just concerned. These are tracking devices, $308,000, but I don't see any. So it's, you're trying to keep accountability on the bad guys or citizens, um, but I don't see any money being spent for the cameras. I know you guys have been working on that and there's appropriations coming, but $308,000 is a lot of money to get spying devices, GPS trackers. Um, I know there's the spoken rules and the unspoken rules, but yeah, I'm just nervous about that. You guys already know everything we do, anyways. You know, you know, you know, you do. So, but uh, hey, let's let's consider. You know, maybe discuss this. Three hundred eight thousand dollars for these spying devices. I'm just concerned that they will not be used properly. Sorry. Thank you, Civilian Oversight Board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Thanks. Thank for you, Mary. I just had a, a question for the chief. Uh, there was a case, uh, I think a Supreme Court case, just uh, last couple of days, correct? My understanding of it is that other states went farther than Phoenix did in what they were doing. The case is about that, that Phoenix's current policy in the areas that Mr. Clark was just talking about complies with what the case just upheld. Is that a fair statement? Mayor Williams, Vice Mayor Waring, that is absolutely correct. The, the equipment we're asking for today is very specifically for use during felony criminal investigations. Uh, if there are other specific questions with me, is Lieutenant Brian Frudenthal and Sergeant Alex Ortiz from the Drug Enforcement Bureau. I, I, I don't think I need other questions, Mayor, that are specific. Uh, it, <laughs> probably not a, I'm sort of a technophobe, so it probably just confused me anyway in that uh, regard, I'll be honest about it. Um, it's not my thing, but I do sort of follow the jurisprudence about, about this issue because it is, a, it is something, as the technology keeps changing, it, it, that's gonna keep coming up, what you can do and what you guys need to do to keep up and so forth. But I just uh, really, it wasn't intentional, but to, to Mr. Clark's point, um, we are complying with the most up-to-date laws and other states had been more aggressive, but that hadn't been what Phoenix had been doing, so. Thank you for uh, thank you for that response, Councilwoman. Thank you. Uh, one of our police commanders gave me a little bit of a briefing on what you have to go through before you can put someone under surveillance, and I think it would be helpful for um, the public just to hear that we can't just decide to to go out and do this surveillance. Sure, Mayor Williams and Council, Councilwoman Gagel. Um That's correct. Anything. Uh, we would have to obtain a search warrant and through, go through the entire investigative process prior to using the equipment that we're using here. Um, also included in this, though, is cameras. Obviously, undercover officers can't wear body-worn cameras that are visible and for everybody to see. So we will be use, utilizing some of this as, far, as part of our undercover operations and cameras, one, to cover us liability-wise and to cover us um, during our investigative process, too. But maybe but, you could speak a little bit about the judiciary as a check on this and how we have to really make a convincing argument that we need. Yes, prior to utilizing any of this uh, surveillance equipment, um, we have to go through, we obviously have to have probable cause and we have to obtain a search warrant. It has to go through the entire investigative process, it has to be vetted by a, a judge um, who will review it and then the, prior to us utilizing any of this equipment. Wonderful, because I think all of us here value privacy, and so it's important to know that correct. there's a real process, and you have to have a made a convincing case before we are. Yes, using correct. This. Wonderful. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Roll call, please. Gallego. Yes. Noah Kowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. Six zero. Thank you, Mayor. Move to approve item 52. Second. Second. <clears throat> Boards on 52. Leonard Clark. Thank you, Mayor and Council Member. Um, I know that this was spoken on somewhat earlier, but I'm just concerned about the emphasis do I believe that our law enforcement who witness horrible things, put their lives on the line every day, that they need traumatic counseling? Of course they do. On the other hand, I've heard you do something courageous today. I hope that you're going to follow through on this task force where if there isn't a person, you know, like on a bus or witnesses somebody, uh, you know, fatalities, these types of things that um, we can explore hopefully getting some type of funding for uh, these traumas. Um, so uh, with that, of course, I ask that you approve this for many officers who put their lives on the line and our firefighters and the rest, but also we have to consider all of the other people who are also witness sometimes to these horrible occurrences because until we get national medical health care where people can go see a psychologist or a counselor or a therapist, at least in Phoenix, people who witness these violent accidents or crimes can get some help. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Sean Severin. Good 
Mayor and uh, members of council, I'll try to make this brief because I'm essentially just going to echo what, what Leonard Clark just said. Uh, in theory, I do absolutely support this. Um, I think public safety officers have an incredibly tough job, and it makes complete sense uh, for those officers who go through a traumatic experience to receive the mental health resources that they need. Um, while I, so while I do support that, I hope this is also a reminder to the council that the public needs to be treated in the same manner. Um, especially for those who are victims of police violence. So help our, help our officers, please. Um, as citizens and members of this community are suffering and dying in the streets, please help them too. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments, questions? I guess uh, just uh, for Dan. So this is, this is simply complying with state law too. Mayor Williams, uh, Councilman Waring, yes, that's correct. This is uh, part of uh, the new requirements set forth by the state legislature. Thank you. Any other? Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. Uh, seven zero. Move to approve item fifty five. Second. Do we have any cards on fifty five? No. I have to read the title. Any comments, questions? I need to read the title. Roll call. I have to read the title. Oh, I'm sorry. We can't. I'm read. trying. <laughs> Item 55, Ordinance G6477, an ordinance amending Ordinance G6453, regulating the licensing of structured sober living homes relating to penalties and enforcement. I hear no comments. We have a motion and a second, so it's roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. Six seven zero. Thank you. Move to approve item sixty-three. Second. Comments? Questions? Yes, Mayor. Uh, Councilwoman. Thank you. Item sixty-three is the tourism and hospitality um, advisory board fund. So this is money that comes from excise taxes on hotel, motel lodging, and rental cars. Um, it's an exciting time in our tourism industry, a lot of big wins and, and um, interest in the Phoenix market, and it's one of our largest and most important uh, industries. We've had a lot of uh, particular emphasis on sports, and I think there's also a lot of value in looking at other areas of tourism, including arts and culture, and um, partnerships with rural Arizona. So in particular, wanted to ask our um, John Chan, if you could talk a little bit about if there's any potentials, particularly um, the Grand Canyon is celebrating its centennial in 2019, February. It's an exciting opportunity for our entire state, the Grand Canyon state. And I would so love it if people are visiting the Grand Canyon to celebrate its centennial, if they arrive through Sky Harbor, I think they will have a much better experience than if they ri arrive through Las Vegas. And would love to partner with the Grand Canyon and, and our partners in rural Arizona to make sure that those Grand Canyon tourists have the Grand Canyon State experience. So I don't know if using these funds or other partnerships with Visit Phoenix, if there's an opportunity there. Thank you, um, Mayor Williams, uh, Councilwoman Gallego. Uh, these funds are really intended for projects and programs that promote tourism, generate room nights, and uh, activities for the city of Phoenix. So all of those things, you know, we a lot of our uh, visitors and convention attendees uh, do side trips to the Grand Canyon, and so it's totally appropriate for uh, a portion of these funds to use to be used to attract tourism and, and generate room nights for the city of Phoenix, but could be done in conjunction with uh, the Grand Canyon, and so we would certainly uh, work with uh, our partners at Visit Phoenix and the Arizona Office of Tourism uh, to accomplish those goals. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Any other comments, questions? Mayor, I'm surprised the Grand Canyon's only been there 100 years. It seems so much, <laughs> seems I so much more permanent than that. I the centennial of the National Park Service is present oh, gotcha, at the Grand gotcha. Canyon. I just had a Sylvia <laughs> Allen moment. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yeah. yeah. And I just, we have not had you up here since the Super Bowl made the announcement. So please congratulate our tourism partner on the 2023 Super Bowl. And if you have any other tourism announcements to share, you feel free as well. <laughs> Hearing no response, roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. 
Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes, 7-0. Move to approve item 65. Second. Hearts. Okay. I think we have lots of donations. Is that what this? Uh, Toby Ritt. Hi, I'm Toby Ritt. I'm the uh, Vice President of Sales for Image Trend, um, the recommended vendor for the electronic patient care reporting system uh, being discussed today. So I want to uh, start by thanking the Mayor and Council uh, for allowing me to be here to speak. Um, we've gone through a fair and competitive bidding process um, in this uh, proposal. Um, the RFP was issued on September 7th, 2017. We were given the highest scores for qualification, experience, and references. Um, the reason for that most likely being that we serve 38 of the 50 states as the state data repository. Uh, in addition to that, we serve similar sized cities to Phoenix and Houston, Dallas, San Diego, Baltimore, New Orleans, Albuquerque, Orange County, Memphis, Nashville, Salt Lake City, and El Paso. In Arizona, we serve the cities of Chandler, Tempe, Surprise, Superstition, Gila River Indian Community, and Yuma. In addition to having the highest qualifications, experience, and references, we were also scored the highest on financial viability, providing very little risk to the city of Phoenix. And in addition, we were also given the highest score on pricing, so we're also providing the best value uh, to the taxpayers of the city of Phoenix. Um, so we thank you for the uh, recommendation, um, and we'd be humbled to uh, serve the city. Thank, thank you. you. Does anyone on the council uh, want a staff presentation on this? No, okay. Then we will go to Kevin O'Malley, who has two cards donating time. Minutes. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Williams, members of the uh, City Council. We also have a PowerPoint presentation I think that's going to come up here in a second. Uh, but we're here today to talk about the procurement and selection of an electronic patient care reporting system. No doubt, every contract for goods and services that the City procures are important. But this EPCR system really addresses what Councilwoman Pastor was talking about a little bit earlier, and that is when one of our citizens faces a medical crisis, a traumatic event. This is your tool. This is your first responder tool that downloads patient information, allows communication to the first responders, to the ambulance providers, and then on to the ER. That needs to be seamless. That needs to work correctly. And our company, Star West Associates, has the, uh, the contract with most of our surrounding communities, and that's important because they have what's called automatic aid. What that means is the boundaries between our communities are erased by our automatic aid partners so that if you have an, an, an event that's near the Glendale border, they'll send the most appropriate closest unit. So they need to work together, they need to work seamlessly. Mr. Ramsey, Bob Ramsey, who is essentially the father of EMS and ambulance services here in the Phoenix area and around the state, this is his company. <clears throat> so we actually have to have a little context here on this selection process. There was an RFP that was issued in 2016, and I want to talk to you about that. That evaluation committee was populated primarily by firefighters, the EMS first responders who use this system in the field. The final score in that first procurement showed a huge victory for the um, Star West, what's called the Zoe EPCR system. I've never seen a score differential as overwhelmingly powerful as this one. Almost 900 points for our client to 300 points for image trend. So what would you expect? You'd expect that then a contract would be issued to our client. Instead, that procurement was canceled. Two-line letter, no explanation, nothing in the contemporaneous records of the city to explain why that occurred. So then it was reissued into a second RFP. And that RFP, the first responder firefighters 
their voices were diminished, they were removed as voting members of the committee. And so now we have a complete reversal. Image trend is now found in the second uh, evaluation, slightly ahead with about 70 additional points. They are now rated higher functionally when we were rated higher functionally before. They're, hi they're rated higher on their prior experience and references. Now, you can't go back and rewrite history. You either have good experience and good references or you don't. And if we look at the references, I want to focus for one second on just one of them. City of Peoria, which is one of our, our automatic aid partners. This was critical and the references that came in from the city of Peoria were, were very important because they had image trend and they changed over to Star West and you can see on the screen all of the positive things that they had to say. The, the fact that the image trend did not work for them and now that they have gone over to our client, the Zoe system is working flawlessly for them. How is it possible that and, and it goes on and on. I, can't, I don't have time to go through all of the positive comments that were, that were talked about, but in terms of that important interoperability, the ability to communicate among all of our partners here, all of those things were so critical and so positive for our people with all of the local, all of the local communities. What about image trend? A gentleman just stood up here and told you about all of the people that they, they do work for, all the big cities they do work for, including communities here in the valley, Tempe and Chandler. They got no positive references from any of them. They didn't submit even the three required references in the RFP, they submitted two. One from Albuquerque and one from a private company uh, that serves in, in Dallas, some area, Fort Worth area. And that reference didn't even check the box to say that they would use them again. So yes, they have these contracts, but what's happening is people like Peoria see their system and leave. So where are the positive references? There aren't any. The problem we have with the second pr proposal and the second process is that the people that use this system, the firefighters and the EMS, their voices were drowned out. The people who use this system and have to work together in our community and surrounding communities their voices were ignored. And I know there's a problem here and I want to address it head on. In our system today, if you do not protest within seven days of the, uh, of the announcement of the award, you're untimely. In this situation, there's no notice. There's no notice that goes out to our clients. They weren't represented by counsel. They filed their protest a day late. They filed it on the Monday instead of the Friday because this process went on for two or three years. And in order to make sure you, you know that that's coming, you have to check the website every day. And they didn't do it. But I'm asking you to, to use your right, your power, under this provision of the city code, which says that the city council always has the discretion under the procurement code to cancel a request prior to the award by the city council. I'm not asking you to award the contract to our people. I, this is not a traditional bid protest. I'm asking you to see the flaws in this system and to decide this needs to be rebid. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Bill Carr, Carn, I believe it is, who has two donations. Madam Mayor and the Council, then it's Bill Corn, C-O-R-N, spelled the oh, simple way. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I get it all the time. Um, I want to talk about some of the pitfalls. The pitfalls of what we're looking at in the contractor in the RFP was that in many contracts, there's many hidden costs, and even Image Trends' own reference from Fort Worth warned about hidden costs. And if I can quote, "Be sure," and this comes from their reference. Be sure to ask about every feature up front and the cost related to the feature. If you are like us, you do not want any financial surprises. In addition, the RFP was very clear. No proposal will be accepted with additional costs unless the cost is specified in the submission. But even in response to the reissued RFP, Image Trends said it could only meet critical technical requirements again, and these include high priority items for un some undisclosed future cost. For example, 
the ability to cross-reference old and new hospital names and codes. This was a high priority item. They've noted in there that it would be an additional custom development at a future to be agreed upon price. The ability to view the distance between a medical emergency incident and the nearest hospital. That's very important in the billing process and being able to bill these things. The ability to connect with the city's security incident and event monitoring system. And what I think is most important is the display of the information regarding the nearest and most appropriate hospital. That's pretty important if you or a loved one is the one that's being transported. And I just want to note here that Zoe has these features and in regards to the nearest and most appropriate hospital, we not only can tell you the nearest and most appropriate hospital, we also give you alternatives that take into account the iOS native tools that can reroute based upon traffic and or construction. And again, Image Trend noted that there would be additional custom development projects for these items at a future cost, which is in direct conflict with what the uh, RFP had put in place. Thank you, and I'd like to yield my time. Pete Garayas. Madam Mayor, members of the council, thank you for this time. Uh, I'd like to talk about the process. Uh, and because, and, and as he just pointed out, you have the ability to, to, to go against uh, this recommendation. I mean, just revisit. Uh, the original score was 904 to 380 something. The next time, it's 777 to 847. What happened? The difference was the first time you had 42 firefighters that were evaluating and involved in the scoring. The second time you had, you had, uh, you had one or two that voted and, and you had eight people come in and do an evaluation and they recommended uh, Zoe. They scored them higher, but yet in the, that was only in the evaluation. In the actual scoring, Emmistrin scored higher. Now, on this, uh, on this thing, I want you to point out, uh, or, or look at what I point out here. Um, in the response, in the first RFP, the panel scored Star West five on both functional and technical requirements, as opposed to one, unacceptable for Image Trend. Even in the response in the second RFP, Image Trend could not meet uh, critical requirements of the cities uh, that the city had identified as high priority. Uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, data security, compliant with national fire protection uh, standards, zero. This is them scoring themselves, zero. Uh, Who's missing? Did I have? Okay. Let me, okay. Uh, two, the ability to choose software updates, and, and so the, the fire department gets to, gets to de determine when those are done. Zero. They scored themselves. The ability to identify, configure, uh, and redact, redact information, uh, which is a HIPAA requirement. They scored themselves, zero. The ability to scan insurance cards, zero. And you know the impact that that's going to have with um, being able to collect uh, for the transportations and the equipment that's used. The other thing was uh, the closest hospital. They gave themselves a zero. Now that's just five of them. There were 16 high critical areas that they gave a zero. How in the world could they have been scored higher than Zoe? Now, and here's the one other thing that I want to point out. In the second panel, they accepted the RFP, even though in 4.1.5, I'll read this, it's up there. Offers are reminded that the specifications stated in the, solution, uh, in the solicitation are a minimum level requirement and that offers submitted must be for products and services that meet or exceed the minimum level of all features specifically listed in this, in this solicitation. Offers offering less than any minimum uh, specifications or criteria uh, specified are not responsive and should not be submitted. They, they should have been thrown out for, for, uh, for, for non-response. Uh, I don't know how th this could have, could have taken place, but we're not talking about pencils and floor tile here. We're talking about a component of emergency medicine, of first responders that, that need to be able to, not only can you tell how far the hospital is, but a lifetime, bet through, uh, multiple routes options. 
lifetime, which means if there's an accident or construction or something, we can tell, how to, tell you how to get there. They couldn't. For those of you that have had this before, uh, that the firefighters that, that have had this uh, or have talked to it, the one other thing I'd like to say is we wanted to speak with all of you about this, and, but we, we were muzzled. We couldn't talk with anybody unless we went through the procurement officer, and we tried three times, three letters to speak with you. I don't know if you got them or not because we, we could never get any information from the procurement officer. And if you didn't get our request to speak to you about this, then thank you. Then you should ask yourselves or ask why. Mayor, uh, as the chair of public safety, I think this is really important. I think we need, each one of us should get some type of briefing on what's going on because it's about saving lives and every second counts. And I like to continue this item till, is it July 5th? So then that we can all have that information and be briefed. Before you do uh, that, I, can I? Wait, yeah. Mm -hmm. we got, that motion, I promised Vice Mayor he could ask some questions. Oh, absolutely. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if the chief is the person to answer this. It might, might be you, Ed. I don't know. So is this, would the police analogy for this, would this be the RMS system? that we put in a few years ago with police that was, it just seemed like that was a hard rollout and so forth, or is that a bad analogy on my part? I'll ask the chief to answer that. Just in terms of what it does, it's RMS is about dispatch, and this is actually about the patients, but I'll let Chief Kalkbrenner, is that your question about the content of what this does? Yeah, just, okay. I just remember how hard it was yes. to kind of set up that system and change from what we were doing before. There was a mention about the different codes and everything. I mean, there was just a lot of glitches, I thought, with the rollout with police. Experienced similar stuff at the state when you change things at Department of Revenue and so forth. So I'm just kind of looking for what, what's the reality? Is this going to be a seamless transition? This here? is going to be difficult. But one difference is in the RMS system with police, we went from one computer system translated right. to another. In this case, we're going from no computer right. system to, to one. From scratch. But yeah. Chief Kalkbrenner. Uh, Mayor, members of council, uh, Vice Mayor Waring, this is a completely separate issue from the RMS okay. system. This is an accoutrement too. It's something we will add a software product to our existing RMS system to be able to go from 40 years of paper transactions to an electronic um, digital format that can be downloaded to the hospital and to our billing center. Um, can I ask a question about, so I think a number was mentioned, 42 firefighters were on the panel the first time, but then only one or two the second time. I'm not questioning the veracity of what we're being told. I'm just wondering from your perspective, is that accurate? Uh, can you explain why that happened? Mayor and Vice Mayor, or Mayor Williams and Vice Mayor Waring, I'll have to defer to the procurement staff who set sure. up the parameters that we were able to uh, work under. Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, members of council, there were 22 field evaluators. They were non-voting members on the first panel. Um, there were three firefighters as voting members and one firefighters as a subject matter expert on the first panel. Uh, when we, when the, the second process was done, we consulted with fire there were two voting members on the fi for fire firefighters and two additional as subject matter experts. But this is so highly technical that the second panel, there was uh, 300 more requirements added. Fire hired a project manager. We made sure we had more technical representation to assess the technical requirements on the, on the second process. Okay. Uh, Something was referenced about the you know request for meetings and so forth. I, I think I did get the request for meeting. I, I always take those, uh, but I I was not able to do it this time. It was I think relatively short notice, so it wasn't that somebody didn't pass it along. At least in my case, <coughs> as I remember. <laughs> Excuse me, your cough is apparently catching, Mayor. I'm sorry, um, but uh, how do you explain? So the the again. I'm taking it face value, but I'd like your analysis of it. So the difference in the numbers from the first time to the second time, the change in the scoring, what would account for something like that? Presumably the products are, are basically the same. Maybe they've made some modifications in that time period, but, but how does, I mean, it sounds like what changed was the people who were on the panel providing the input. That's kind of the implication. So is there something I'm missing about that scoring? Um, Mayor, Mayor, members of the council, 
um, contrary to what Star West argues, these right. were not the same RFPs, and the process was different. The city issued the current RFP uh, one year later with significant revisions with a project manager on the team. Um, and excuse me, that's the 300 new the 300 additional about. requirements. Right. Additionally, the scoring is different because the technical makeup of the voting members is different. We wanted to make sure with the concerns for IT projects that there was much more technical representation on the panel, on the voting members. The first panel didn't have that technical representation, so when the scores came in, the panel couldn't explain their scores. I've been in procurement a long time. I've never seen a score go down as drastically as I did in the first process. When we asked the panel to explain it, they could not explain it. That is why we had to throw out the first process. Okay, so uh, throwing out the first process was a staff decision, not a council decision. Because I was like, we got a lot of contracts and I didn't remember if that was us or you. It sounds like it was you guys. You weren't satisfied with, with how it worked out. We consulted with fire, with law, and uh, the project manager and the decision was made that we had a problem with the And sport. I'm sure you can see how the winning company took that. <laughs> not well, they just told right. us. So, uh, so I guess your argument, I'm not necessarily saying I agree, I don't have enough information probably to agree, but your argument is the second panel, for lack of a better way of phrasing it, knew more about the subject and provided a more accurate score. It sounds like if I summarize kind of what you're saying. Uh, Vice Mayor, uh, members of council, yes. What th There was a lot of work done working with fire administration to make sure we had good representation for technical evaluation where we had some holes in the first panel. Um, the technical piece was so critical to this, this piece, but more importantly, there's, there was a couple things that were done. Obviously, I mentioned we, we increased the technical and functional requirements from the first procurement to the second procurement, but the panel composition changed significantly to include more technical members. And the, the demonstrations, which are so important during the first process, were different. The second process, we made it apples to apples. They had to do the demonstrations on the same device. So it was consistent. Thank you. Uh, so it sounds like, if I summarize what you've said so far, you changed the composition of the panel, got more sort of experts in this particular area, and you also refined what you were looking for. You were much more, it sounds like, specific. You added 300 things. You're like, this is really what we want, and these are the correct people to be sort of guiding us in picking the product. Yes, and, and contrary to what Star West is indicating, there were critical items and high priority items. If there was going to be something that was additional cost, the uh, image trend would have had to list a cost. They, they included those items as critical, so they, they were part of the overall cost that we evaluated. One thing that would be a little concerning to me, but again, I haven't read the letters. I just, I know what was said here. Uh, the letters of reference. So <laughs> when you're in public life, you're a conservative. When you're at home, your family just calls you cheap. But either way, one thing that drives me crazy is hidden costs and so forth as we're referenced. But you're confident for the price that we're paying, you're getting all the stuff that you would need with this product that you're recommending. Yes, um, correct. Um, you know, I know Star West argues that the references were not scored uh, properly, but the scoring in the first was for qualifications, experience, and references worth 150 points, and only 100 points in the second RFP process. Um, the scoring in the, uh, the second RFP process is defensible as an indication of a different approach by a different panel, a change in the demonstration process, including some revisions to the scope under scoring under some of the categories. Uh, the Fort, I think it was Fort Worth, as I remember, I think there were two letters that were referenced. The Fort Worth rep letter, it seems curious to me, did they actually put in there, beware of hidden costs, and did they also not check the box, we definitely use these guys again? If, if I was hiring an individual and that was the case, I'd, I'd be concerned. I don't have an answer to the Fort Worth thing, it can image trend, I, I don't know where that came from in the RFP process. From they don't serve the city of Okay, Florida. I thought I heard that reference. I'm just, maybe it was a different Texas city. I yeah, don't know. But, it wasn't uh, in the RFP. Okay, there was nothing relating to referenced. that. I, apparently, I got it wrong. Probably not for the first and last time. Okay, I think I'm good, Mayor. Thank you. I appreciate okay. it. Comments or questions? I'm still here to speak. I don't have a card on you, Bob. Yeah. You do? For Bob Ramsey? I think you do. I'm okay doing that. I'm sorry, Mayor. 
No, but go ahead and we'll have the fill one out. Oh, all right. Well, uh, just for, uh, I just want to tell you that I'm honored to be before you because I'm a lifelong, as you know, a resident in this, uh, in Arizona as well as my, as my family. I'm, I'm not only president of Star West, but I'm also president of the Ramsey Social Justice Foundation, which has done uh, work since I was a young lad, and we still do it. The issue about an EPCR, and especially one for Arizona, is one that has to have the ability to be able to be adaptable to the workflows of the people doing it. The reason for an EPCR is that it has to be exchanged, the data has to be exchanged with the automatic aid partners. The reason for an EPCR in 911 services in a high performance is that you've got to be able to download data from not only the CAD, but download da data from other information systems, such as historical billing, such as social issues, such as the behavioral components that we have in there. The reason for an EPCR in a high performance system has to have, it has to have language so that you have people who do not speak English can be able to speak to it and you can translate to it. All these things is what we in our product have. I've spent decades, as you well know, in EMS, not only here in Arizona, but around the world. And I can tell you that for the last few decades, I have spent my time, my money, and my, our ability and our be able to develop the greatest thing for Arizona. We have to be concerned. If you look at the, if I could just segue just one moment. And I really appreciate what you spoke about between the first RFP and the second RFP. But by his own language, he tied both proposals together. Hear what he said. And so therefore, I think you need to consider both of those, propo uh, both of those pr proposals. Life is important. Data and life that's transported within that data creates continuity of care. Your funding is at risk, care is at risk, interoperability and cost are at risk. You have to have a system that is seamless and it's written for Arizona. Thank that you. is what we have done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Mayor, I'd like to, I'd like to make a motion to continue this. No when? July 5th? July 5th. Okay, the motion is to continue the 5th. Do I have a second? Mayor, well, it, you know, it is a common practice to give our colleagues a little more time. Well, I think we ought to have some questions for the staff, too, though. Right. Well, before I second the motion, I want to know if, I want to know where that puts us, from the city manager and the chief. Is, is, does the extra week uh, put us at a, at a major disadvantage where we can't continue this? Uh, Mayor, uh, Councilman Valenzuela, I don't believe that one week will be a problem in terms of this process. As you said, it's gone, it's been a couple of years we've been in process, so one more week we can uh, absolutely honor the request for more briefings. Second. Okay, we now have a second for that. I have a question too. Um, the process was thorough. It was per our regulations, right, our ordinances. And was there a protest made? Uh, Mayor and Council, yes, there was a protest. And the protest, as mentioned by Star West, was late. According to our city code, they have to file a protest within seven days of us posting the notice of recommendation for award. And they did not meet that timeline. Um, they also failed in two other areas required by the city code. They failed to state a legal and sufficient factual basis for their protest. Um, this they did then appealed when we denied their protest and this went to an administrative law judge for review he recommended to the city manager that we deny the protest and appeal okay I, go ahead 
So is it customary when that process happened that uh, we cancel this and issue a new RFP? Or not accept the recommendation, I guess is maybe. I'm trying to figure out where we would go in the next step is we would have to reject the recommendation and then ask to issue a new RFP? Is that um, what we're talking about here? Yes, Mayor and Council, the next step, since it's for um, up for approval of the contract recommendation, your next step, you would either <laughs> cancel the solicitation or you would approve the contract recommendation. Since it's been through the full process, you would have to cancel the, the solicitation. We would have to reissue. Okay, and Karen, are you recommending we go through with this? I'm confident that the process was followed. Um, the firefighters did not have, in, from Local 483, did not have as, as much say as they did in the first one, and they weren't terribly happy with that. But with the technical expertise that was necessary to identify the inside dynamics of this computer, I think the technical people that were on the board were appropriate. Thank you. Okay. Question? Do I, did you second? There was a second. Okay. Okay. Uh, Councilman. Any further questions? I made a second. It's a continuance okay. to July 5th, mm -hmm. and then we will be able to vote. So, Mayor, I have a question. So do we have to request a public hearing to actually listen to either side, or is it it's still a blackout period? Mayor, uh, Councilman Nowakowski, the transparency policy is in effect, and um, I would ask the city attorney or this is a city attorney to explain that. Good question. Yes, uh, Council, uh, Mayor Williams, uh, Councilman Nowakowski, yes. So the blackout period is continues into effect until the council awards the contract. So Let me, I just would clarify, it's not a blackout. It is a, it's, it's a requirement that communication happen in a public setting. Right, so essentially what we have to do is we post the meeting, it's open to all the public, and so it's not a blackout period, it's just that it's open to all, and it needs to be posted as we would any other meeting. And I believe we do it individually? Yes, what we've actually in the past, we've actually had joint meetings if that's the will of the council member we can do it individually it just has to be posted under the transparency clause and a non-quorum but and a non-quorum it can't be a potential quorum of a subcommittee or the council itself <clears throat> i need some clarity uh since i did the second before the questions were answered <laughs> um I feel like this is deja vu right now <laughs> of another case that we had several months ago. So in, um, I did receive the notice uh, regarding wanting to meet or could we meet. However, I chose not to. Um, and so what I'm hearing from you, Dan, is that it's the same process as the other item in the past. Mayor Williams, Council uh, Women Pastor, that's correct. So if a council member receives a request, they can, they can um, not meet if they choose not to. If they want to meet, then we will set notice. The difference between um, another procurement was that was actual litig that was involved in the hearing at the time. Um, and that was before the Office of Administrative Hearings. Again, once that hearing, the, the hearing officer, the administrative law judge made their determination, then we said the, the litigation, the potential being involved in that hearing was no longer present. So that's the difference between this process this afternoon and the prior process. But that makes sense? Right, it's not much difference. So my question then to Tom 
or whoever who can answer is that there was a protest period and in that protest period nobody protested seven within the seven days that is mayor and council that is correct the protest that we received from star west was late and therefore we denied the protest um, they appealed that decision we took it up to an administrative law judge that upheld our denial okay I would prefer not to continue it so how do I take my <laughs> so we do not have a second right at this moment mayor Williams the the councilwoman may withdraw her second and so it would then be up to another council member to second the motion in order for it to continue thank you I, I find it difficult to not continue the motion if staff is saying it's okay I just, to continue yeah. it. And no, I, 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 I re totally respect Councilwoman Pastor's decision. I'm just explaining my reason for continuing okay. and, and making a second here. I do, uh, and so I just explained why I'm, I'm going to second the motion. Um, if a meeting is created, open meeting is created, which is the process. Um, I, I will accept the meeting, and if anyone else in this council is, is uh, considering doing it to save time, if maybe we can, I'm willing to jump into who's ever meeting, um, which is also part of my personal process as well. I've always taken meetings like that. Uh, I, I do want to be fair to the winning bidder, this gentleman who's wanting to say a few words, and if it's okay, I, I think we should hear him out. Well, we're now to, he would need to speak on the motion to continue. Okay. On the motion to continue, um, I mean, this, this kind of presents a burden to us. I mean, we traveled out here today to speak and to be here at the council, so you're asking us to get back on a plane next week, come back and meet with you guys again. We're happy to do it, but it is a significant burden and kind of a waste of our time today. Um, second, I, I mean, the the points raised were on the 2016 RFP are fairly irrelevant. I mean, we commit a lot of money to research and development here. Um, and to state that nothing could change in a period of two years doesn't really make sense to us. Uh, the city of Goodyear uh, recently in February of 2018 uh, chose to switch from Zoe Star West to Image Trend, and we contracted with them now. I think you need to stick on the continuance, please. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I think as far as the continuance goes, I mean, we can keep continuing this on forever. We've done two RFPs now. We've done an, a, a denial. We've done a denial of the protest. We've also gone to a administrative court. Um, I mean, Star West is not going to accept any outcome that does not award them the winner. They're going to keep coming back here again and again. Um, so, I mean, and they'll keep creating more people. We can do the same, but we're just going to keep ending up back in the same place. So, I mean, we would object to the motion to continue. Thank you. Further comments? Councilwoman Gallego? She's still on the phone? I'm guessing not. Okay. And do a roll call. <coughs> roll call, please. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. So this is continued. Uh, unanimous. Seven zero takes us to item 66, which, uh, do we have a second? second? We have a card blue. I'm paying, paying 10 pounds. Oh, for me? Oh, I don't know how to, <laughs> you don't have a PowerPoint presentation. No. <coughs> 
On item 66, it's the uh, proposed, uh, uh, want to read it right, proposed bus service improvements. Uh, the process that you guys do, I feel is flawed because it doesn't do the public outreach that should occur. Um, it's an ongoing process. Right now, you're getting ready for the April changes next year, and supposedly we're doing outreach in that, but as you and I know, uh, the outreach is insufficient at best. When I see the public input process, I note that uh, when this was going on, they did put stuff on the 41 bus, but since it is an ongoing process, I wanted to have public input earlier requesting. These are the routes we need, such as uh, Osborne. Is there a reason that we don't have buses every half mile in the congested part of our city? And uh, I know that we have ones like Campbell that are broken up, but I look at Encanto and Oak, I look at Osborne, I look at Roosevelt, where are their buses? If we're a major metropolitan area, they should have them and they should be running efficiently. And as to the proposed changes of them being intermodal, where is the connectivity between all of the modes? And with that, I'll give you back some of your time and thank you for your courtesies. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? Quick comment, Mayor. Go ahead, please. Thank you. I, I'm a former, former member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Subcommittee, and when uh, I was on the committee, I kept trying to get Maria to work with us for the holiday changes, because I know that there are many people in my community who don't um, necessarily get every holiday off and for whom the holiday schedule was a real burden. And I would like to thank you for your leadership in getting neighboring communities on board as well. I think these changes to have more service on these holidays are a huge benefit to our ridership and will really make people's lives a lot easier. So thank you so much. I'm looking forward to supporting this item and I'm so glad we were able to restore weekday service on these five holidays. Thank you. Uh, further comments? Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. <laughs> Seven zero. I believe we are now to uh, 81. Move item 81. Second. Uh, Mayor, a potential Continue. conflict. Okay. I'm trying to get to 81. 81. Oh, together? All right. Uh, is public hearing? Mayor, members of council, there's no public hearing necessary for this item. It was not appealed. It just oh. wasn't part of the omnibus because of the the conflict uh, declared by Councilman Nowakowski. So it's free for someone to make a motion and second. And, and we can I can, bond, I can move. Yeah. Together. I think we did. Together, yes. Okay. So can you add 82? We'll All right, we have a motion to uh, approve 81 and 82. Do second. I have a second? Second. Okay. Do I have any cards? No. Comments? No. Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Thank you. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. So it's 5-2? Five 5-0, two? Five zero. Five zero, I mean. Okay. Uh, 83? Where's 83? Can we do 83 and 84 together? Hey, Mayor, members of council, we can do 83 and 84 uh, together. They do require a, a public hearing. I believe there, there may be a card or two on these items, but they're a general plan amendment and a zoning case for the right. same parcel. All right, we will open the public hearing. Uh, you give a presentation first or? Yes, I'll, I'll okay. give a, a quick presentation. Mayor, members of council, item 83 is a general plan amendment request for the northwest corner of 27th Street and Baseline Road. The uh, applicant in this case is requesting a designation to commercial from residential 1 to 2 and 5 to 10 dwelling units per acre. Staff does recommend approval. You can see the, the subject site here. 
uh, outlined. You see residential around it, uh, for the most part, baseline road, and there's commercial off to this side over here of it. Uh, this general plan amendment uh, did go through the, the hearing process uh, and was approved by the South Mountain Village Planning Committee by a 10 to 5 vote and the Planning Commission by a 6 to 0 vote. This just shows you the colors as it currently exists uh, and this would be a continuation of the commercial designation on that north side of, of Baseline Road uh, to commercial the, as shown red on the general plan. The corresponding zoning case is to go from a mix of different zoning categories all within the baseline area overlay zoning district uh, to a proposed request of uh, C1 for uh, commercial retail uses and medical uses. Uh, this request was approved by the Village Planning Committee by a 12 to 3 vote, also approved by the Planning Commission uh, by a 6 to 0 vote. Uh, there's the subject site again for you, the surrounding zoning. Here's the proposed site plan. One of the uh, elements that came out of this discussion with staff and the applicant is wanting to align uh, this driveway that you see here up with a driveway that already exists on the south side of Baseline Road. Uh, as the mayor and council know, whenever we have new development that comes in, we try and make sure that driveways uh, line up because that eliminates safety conflicts. Uh, when you have people that are looking across, particularly a, a big road like Baseline, you can see a car directly on the other side. That is what helps people then identify, okay, there's a car over there to make a left as opposed to being offset. And so if you see in the, the aerial photograph here, the current 27th uh, street is offset. It connects here, and then here's the one on the south. The proposed development, uh, the applicant is uh, willing to do at the request of staff is to realign this so that as you come out of this residential development, instead of going down here, you will connect here and that will alleviate a, a traffic conflict on Baseline Road that, that exists today. Staff does recommend approval of this request. Here's the proposed uh, elevations uh, that go with this project. There was a memo that came out earlier today that addresses a new site plan, some landscaping, uh, the street alignment and notification issues uh, to address some of the neighborhood concerns. And with that, staff is happy to answer any questions. Are there questions, comments? Uh, I have uh, some cards, but they, I believe, are all in favor except one who is neutral. Uh, Kay Gunter, did you want to speak? Or are you just neutral? Uh, the, I have a motion. Close the well, I, I was just wondering if you wanted to hear any of these speakers, I guess is what I'm asking more than. Did you, Brian, Great House, I'll bet you want to speak even though you said only if necessary. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, uh, members of the council. Um, we have struck a compromise with the neighbors. Uh, they had concerns about drive-through facilities and we've crafted um, along with staff and I'd like to request uh, one additional modification to uh, stipulation 1A in the memo, and right now it states the quantity and configuration of individual buildings on the subject site. I would like to request that that stipulation says the quantity and configuration of drive-through facilities. And we've presented that to the neighbors as well, and I don't want to speak for them, but I believe that they are in agreement with that. I see nodding yes. I don't see anybody shouting no. So. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Okay. I will close the public hearing. We will now um, need a motion. I need a motion. Move for approval of this item based on the Planning Commission's April 5th, 2018 recommendation. I'm, that's, I'm sorry. Re move approval based on the Planning Commission's June 7th recommendation and adopt the related resolution. Second. Okay. Okay. Um, Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. 
Mayor Williams. Yes, 7 0. Uh, now would be 84. Move to approve item 84. And, and I think what, what you meant in your motion was based on the June 27th memo from the planning director with the one exception of revising stipulation 1A to replace the word individual buildings with drive to drive through facilities and adopt the rated related It's like resolution. you can read minds. Yes. It's amazing. <laughs> I second that excellent okay. motion. <laughs> Further second comments, okay. <laughs> Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. Seven zero. Takes us to item eighty seven. Uh, do we have a brief staff explanation of what we're doing here? Thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the council. This item uh, was placed on the agenda at the request of, uh, of you, Mayor uh, Williams and Vice Mayor Waring to allow for a discussion and possible action uh, and uh, for direction to staff regarding the evaluation of the transportation 2050 uh, revenues project and expenditure schedules um, uh, as part of um, uh, evaluating how adjustments to either future light rail or other transportation projects could allow the ex expediting of street pavement maintenance, uh, possibly to even include the use of financing to accelerate that street paving. Um, so that's that's the item before you uh, now. We, uh, staff does not have a, a planned presentation, but is uh, here to answer any questions. With me is Maria Hyatt, Street Transportation Director, Ken Kessler, the Acting Public Transit Director, Kini Knutson, our City Engineer, and Jesus Sapien, Light Rail Administrator. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor, you have questions? Mayor, I appreciate it. Thank you. I do. Uh, so. Well, I presume to speak for other members, but I think those of us who represent North Phoenix hear a lot about uh, the condition of roads, rightfully so. I've spent a lot of time with Mark Glock, who you all know. Uh, he's an excellent staffer at the city. We spent a lot of time in his uh, city vehicle driving around with constituents looking at potholes and crush streets and so forth. Uh, obviously, I've said many times before, I'm not a fan of light rail. Um, it will never actually be in District 2, at least as currently constituted. But, uh, and it's also, though, for our purposes here today, it's a long way off. So even if you wanted that to be an alternative to driving, and that wouldn't be the case, obviously, for, for the vast majority of people, regardless, um, you're, you're talking 15, 20 years out before it might reach the location that is currently Paradise Valley Mall. So I think uh, in a couple of us sort of putting our heads together, thought, what can we do to expedite fixing roads, which, which is badly needed? Uh, one way we could do that is to delay some of these other projects, including some of the light rail lines. Um, again, speaking only for myself, I, I haven't had a lot of people clamoring uh, to me for, you know, when are we going to get that line up to the Paradise Valley Mall? You know, 20 something years from now probably isn't what they'd want to hear, even if they were doing that. So I think the hope would be we had a long discussion, two long discussions about this subject last week. I think the hope would be that, let me state it this way, and you guys can confirm whether it's a fact or not, three of the lines are sort of in play here for a discussion in terms of how quickly or whether we move forward. Is that a fair statement? We have to do some high capacity transit in those corridors, but it doesn't necessarily have to be light rail. Is that correct? So, uh, Mayor Councilman Waring, um, so the the T twenty fifty plan in, uh, that was approved by voters as Proposition one hundred four included uh, the approval of the comprehensive transportation plan that the council had approved, uh, and the map that was on the ballot, uh, and so that comprehensive transportation plan identified um, specific miles on the on uh, light rail. Uh, that had already been approved by the council where the approval and action had been taken for um, 
for a, uh, uh, the alignment identification and the mode of travel. Within that plan, though, there were um, certain, there were uh, locations and alignments that had not been identified at that point for or action taken by the council at that point on that alignment or the mode of travel. So the, it was identified as high capacity transit, but not yet identified specifically as light rail within that plan. That was the plan that was recommended by the Citizens Committee on the future of Phoenix transportation and brought forward to the council. The council referred that plan to the voters. Um, included in those was the, the Northeast extension that you're referring to, uh, which was had not been uh, approved at that point. Um, another was the um, a reference to the, the ASU West alignment in the future and, and also uh, the West Phoenix alignment. So those are the three that, that I just referenced. You the highlighted the specific. So there's flexibility with those three. As we discussed last week, there wasn't nearly as much flexibility with the other four that were already in development by the time of the vote in 2015. So, and I, I respect all of you, as I've, I've said many times. So last week I put something forward to put something back on the ballot to discuss just the, uh, the South Central line, and it failed six to two. So I recognize I may be against light rail, but it was minority opinion. But, uh, but in this case, um, we have an opportunity to potentially fix a badly needed problem, streets either throughout Phoenix or, in, or certainly in North Phoenix, much more quickly than we would otherwise if we proceed with the, the plans the way it's currently going. So I guess what I would propose, Mayor, and I can make it in the form of a motion or we can discuss it, whichever you would prefer, I would like staff to go ahead and give us options if we either weren't gonna do the light rail on those three lines, but we were still gonna fulfill the commitment to voters, because I understand it's passed at the ballot, we can't, can't just totally throw it out, even if I'd like to. Uh, so I'd like some clarity as to how much money we're talking about, what kind of timing delays we could implement, how much money that would garner us that we could direct towards streets, uh, what, is, what is the, I guess, what options are there if we weren't going to do light rail? What else would fit the bill for high capacity transit in those corridors and the costs? So we can evaluate cost savings, how much money would left over to, again, to, to deal with the issue that I think is of paramount importance, the streets, which is still where the vast majority of people every day are, are traveling. And they're definitely noticing that we're not, uh, we're not doing as good there as we could. I'm sure you guys are doing as good as you can with the limited resources you have but this is about transferring resources while still working within the parameters of the voter passed 2015 T2050. Now, is that, is that enough for either discussion or? Can I yeah, ask sure, you? absolutely. I, I thought I heard you say terminate and I thought we were talking about- I did about not use the word terminate. Okay. Yes. That's why I want to make sure we could delay I, this project. I, I, I did use the word delay, though. I, you or that right, yes. All right. Or perhaps adjust. Adjust or delay. Yeah. Use that, adjust or adjust delay. Or, adjust or delay. Because you did mention that um, there might be an alternative to light rail, like the Northeast. We've been talking about the bus rapid transit in uh, transportation infrastructure. So there are other possible creative ways to have mass transit connect to. Yeah, yeah and I, Mayor, I, just so you know, and thank you, uh, uh, Councilman Stark. You know, I, I don't think I used the word terminate, but the goal would be, do we have to do light rail or can we do something else? And frankly, if that something else is quite a bit cheaper and moves kind of the same number of people or anywhere close, then we'd have money left over to fix the streets, which is moving most of the people every day. If I had to boil it down, that would be it. Do you notice we're moving them closer and closer? We are, I'm impressed. <laughs> You're open-minded, Jim. Um, I, and I would second that motion if. Uh, I, I support the motion fully. I believe very strongly that uh, when that was passed, uh, things were a little different then. And since that time, uh, the northern area in particular, uh, our streets are so bad. And we're probably at least a third of the north area they won't, they don't have buses. All they have is streets. They're never gonna have 
uh, I won't say never, but it will be decades before alternative transportation is there. Uh, Glendale canceled, doesn't want to build light rail. Uh, I think there's just different dynamics in play right now that we can consider, uh, but I think delaying gives us an opportunity to fund a lot of uh, street repairs and still can evaluate options, including light rail, because I do support light rail. Mayor, can I say one, one thing? Uh, just uh, because a, a gentleman, Wes Harris, was here earlier, he I guess he pulled a packet yesterday to put something on the ballot by collecting signatures. So obviously I made a motion last week to at least give voters another bite at the apple, at least for one line about the light rail. Uh, that failed, I recognize that. So, uh, but if somebody goes to the ballot, I, I certainly reserve the right to support that, even though I'm so open-minded to <laughs> But, uh, but uh, you know, okay. but it, obviously in th this is something that we can try to f get a better grip on and address right now, yeah. as opposed to, you know, me being one person signing a petition and hoping they get the ballot, stuff to get on the ballot and so forth. Well, That's a different I, piece. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree, because I'm hoping that we can find enough resource there that we could improve major streets uh, and have them completed in the next four to five years. So it would be a great help and greatly what? appreciated. I, you want to do cards or? Oh, go ahead. Uh, Sparky Smith. Thank you, Mayor Williams, Vice Mayor Waring. Uh, Mario, uh, do you have the wording on the on the ballot proposition there in front of you, please, sir? I'm, and what I'm making reference to, there was, if I remember correctly, former Mayor Stanton caused cr quite a stir when at the last minute he changed some of the wording on the ballot. They opened the window for changes that you might want to make down the road. And that's what I'm here to address, if, if my memory serves me correctly, because I hadn't got to look at the, but I just remember there was quite a debate at the time. Uh, Mayor, yeah. members of the council, there's, there's, there's extensive language on the ballot, um, but I would point to um, the, the paragraph that, that is, gives the most clarity uh, under the description um, that says the funds will support a comprehensive multimodal transportation plan that provides Phoenix residents with more transportation choices, including light rail buses and buses, as well as builds and improves public streets and roadways. Um, and so that's, that's, that, that's a statement that is, is pretty clear about what the purpose of the funds is to be used for in addition to the map on the ballot and the additional language. Thank you. I'm here in to encourage you in support of this Proposition 87 that's on the address. As a member of the City Transportation Commission, I have watched many presentations over almost the last three years and heard incredible stories of how staff from one way or the other is trying to draw the money out, extend the life of our streets, and putting Band-Aid after Band-Aid after Band-Aid when they don't have the resources. And we didn't have the votes on that particular commission and what to where we had the minority didn't get, and we don't have any authority anyway. We're just an advisory group, so but this subject has been covered multiple times in which staff is doing any, it, unbelievable work with the resources that they have, trying to extend the, but the first presentation we saw, they were projecting a 65 year life cycle on these streets. That even in Phoenix is insanely optimistic. So I encourage you to please explore this because after all, this is a much easier vote than two that you've already experienced this afternoon with the zoning hearing and the uh, contract because in this you get to benefit a vote on something that will benefit virtually every citizen in the city of Phoenix and that is to improve the condition of our streets. Thank you for your time and I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I have cards in favor but um, 
not necessarily to speak. Peggy Neely. Don Luke. He's down here. Oh, is it Don Lake? Don Luke. He's gone. That's what I thought. Uh, Dave Dottery. He's not here yet, but it's gone. But they're all in favor of the motion. Councilwoman Gallego. Thank you so much. Uh, first to our, our distinguished commissioner, I want to send you down to the Arizona legislature to lobby for her funds and get us more uh, our fair share from the legislature. The good news, though, is, is when we started Prop 104, it was true. We were repaving our streets on average every 65 years, but now we touch them every 10 years. Is that right, Director Hyatt? Uh, Mayor, Councilwoman Gallego, yes, that is our goal, to touch them every 10 years um, with some sort of uh, pavement maintenance treatment that will extend the life of those streets. Wonderful. Thank you. And then I want to key in also on something that, that the commissioner mentioned, which was they didn't have the votes at the Citizens Transportation Commission to change this. So I think we really need to ask ourselves, why do we have a Citizens Transportation Commission if we are not letting them weigh in on this? Why have we asked some of the most distinguished residents of our community to serve their time? This body, when we passed Proposition 104, included language requiring the Citizens Transportation Commission to advance transparency, public input, government accountability. All expenditures under this plan shall be reviewed by a Citizens Transportation Committee. So we've had many transportation commissions where decisions where we've had extensive process for the complete streets, uh, we had a Complete Streets Commission, the Citizens Transportation Commission, the Development Advisory Board, I think all of the Village Planning Commissions. I mean, it goes on and on. The Transportation and Infrastructure Subcommittee. We don't have that input here, and I think that's important, that process matters here. Um, we've gotten some criticism at, at this body for having a full meeting of the Public Council, of the City Council that wasn't televised, which we'd not done in quite a while. We need to have these discussions out in the open, and we need to give our citizens the opportunity to provide input. Uh, Proposition 104 was designed with an extensive stakeholder process. We are two and a half years into implementing that. Um, we had originally asked the Citizens Transportation Commission to update it every 10 years. At the request of some commissioners, they said, we are going to look at it every five. But we are not yet at that milestone. So I would ask my colleagues to really think about accountability to the voters. We told the voters we were going to do something, and we need to make that commitment. It is very likely that Proposition 500, the uh, Maricopa County-wide infrastructure plan, may be on the ballot. Voters, to approve that, will need to trust elected officials that we're going to do what we say. And if we have a reason to change it, then we ought to go out there and explain that to them with extensive public input. So this particular decision hasn't gone to the CTC or to the Transportation and Infrastructure um, Committee of the City Council. And we really ought to have that review. We need to meet our commitments. This council sent a strong uh, message to the voters and to our public when we approved the Citizens Transportation Commission, which we did unanimously. We even got Council or Vice Mayor Waring to vote for that particular. Mark, he's a distinguished citizen. I had to vote for him. <laughs> <laughs> but, to, but the creation of the CTC was approved by this body unanimously. So. Councilman DeCicio voted for it. This is, it was, it was a remarkable day <laughs> at the Phoenix City Council. And it said that we, they would review and make recommendations to the City Council on projects that are funded in whole or in part by Transportation 2050. That they would have performance measures and review. So we, I think, really need to honor that. I certainly agree that transportation and streets are incredibly important and a priority to the citizens. There are many ways to fund it. Obviously, I would love to see the legislature step up on both transportation, streets, and transit. This, um, there's been some court decisions recently which open up new forms of revenue potentially to the city. Uh, pension ref uh, paying our pension responsibilities remains my top priority, but I would love to see us look for new opportunities to fund infrastructure. We need to do a thorough review which involves the public and invest in transparency. So I will be not voting no on the motion. Mayor, can I? Oh. Vice Mayor. Thank you. So, uh, so just a couple things. So um, I think, first of all, my, my original line of questioning indicates that, that I accept we have to work within what voters laid out for us. And the motion does that. So I think 
we're not we're not changing anything and then this meeting is televised so we're here we're, we're telling everybody what we're doing and it also fits within what the outline that voters have given us I think we're trying to be respectful of businesses along Camelback and so forth that have raised serious concerns about uh, what light rail might do to them and um, <coughs> you know I, I think we saw last week we don't want to replicate those meetings not that it wasn't fun but having lots of angry citizens show up and, and say that they feel misled, that's bad too. And so we're gonna to try to avoid that in the northern part of the city if we can. Uh, I would say this, this is not the final word on this subject. I think my goal, and I don't know that I said it specifically, but I think, uh, Ed, you and I have talked, I think the goal would be to have a report back, you know, early September. I think that's realistic. And so we would be, be hoping to then vote on whatever the folks bring back. This is really more information gathering at this point, much as I'd like it to be the final word today. You know, we don't have enough information to do that. Once they go back and look at what they can do within the parameters that voters have given us, then we will have something to vote on. Uh, voters would have a couple months, two, two and a half months to sort of observe uh, this process and get information from our staff, as will we. So this is not some rush thing where this is the final word today. Um, this is a chance for us to find out what's possible to address an issue, and I think Sparky put it, <laughs> sorry. William Smith, Mr. Smith, the Honorable Mr. Smith of our Transportation Committee put it very well. This is something that affects literally every Phoenix resident, from babies to all of us, because we're all driving on the roads at some point. There's just no getting around it, um, or walking on them or something. So it's, it's a way that I think at least three of us thought we might find a way to address at least a big concern in our areas for sure. Our roads are not good and we're trying to fix it. It's great that 2015 made it a little bit better, but it would be, you'd be hard pressed to uh, uh, take that analysis away if you just drove around in North Phoenix. Thank you. Yeah. I think Deborah had a um, I don't disagree with uh, Councilwoman Gallego that we need to uh, respect a process uh, would it, and I think all we're requesting is this look take a look at this and see if we can do it I think we have some flexibility and I will tell you that a, a lot of people that live in district 3 when they voted on it they were really and I walked with <laughs> mr. Glock the other day and they and we were walking in the neighborhood who thought oh I voted for prop 104 when do I see my streets get improved so I think you know that there was some perception from some of the voters that they would be getting their streets fixed very soon w but would you be willing if we look at this to maybe then send it to the appropriate body and have a discussion there as well and vet it through I, I just I guess I'm I, I I just hear so much from my constituents that they want the roads improved I absolutely support um, investing in our roads. I just, I'm concerned. I think last week's council vote showed a crack in support for the light rail. I'm concerned about the message we're sending. I worry that, frankly, other cities that are competing less with federal for fund funding will say, Phoenix is not committed, give the money to us. So I wanna show strong support for what we told the voters that we would do and really look creatively if we can look to our other funding sources to improve our infrastructure. This is just an important decision about what Phoenix will look like in the future, and we should not take it lightly. Thank you. Um, first, uh, I, I just noticed Mark Glock is in the audience, so let it, uh, the record reflect. I would not have said all those nice things about him if I had known he'd been sitting there hearing them, so, uh, so there's that. But I, uh, I, I understand uh, what Deborah is saying. You know, the, the signs during the campaign a lot of those signs said, where's the effect to fix our streets? And, and the question I get a lot is, hey, when are we gonna put that thing on the ballot to like fix the streets? I'm like, well, this was a 35 year, I think $31 billion plan. You guys can check my numbers. Uh, I don't see myself, when I look in the mirror, I do, but I, I don't see myself as particularly old, but I'm 50. This takes me to, I think, 82. So a lot of our population won't sadly even see the end of this plan this is the plan for the rest of their lifetimes so you know i don't know that we're planning on putting another thing on the ballot to fix the streets so 
I do want to be respectful of voters and, and their feelings, and I think some of them feel like they were misled. And if we want to send a strong message to other governmental entities, you know, we should have some more meetings with roomfuls of angry people who feel like they've been misled. We just did that twice last week. So I think this is I, I, what I perceive anyway as a good faith effort to try to head that off and address what I think some, some of us at least think is a pretty serious problem that is not getting better. I, I appreciate the efforts and I appreciate uh, Sparky Smith, you know, uh, mentioning the, 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 you know, the work that the street transportation partner is trying to do to, to sort of plug holes in the dike, but, but bottom line, um, it doesn't seem to be getting better. The complaints seem to ratchet up. We have made some improvements in our area, but I think we're just trying to figure out how we can do a lot more a lot quicker because there was also a lot of neglect for a period of quite a few years there. Uh, Sparky mentioned that, you know, trying to stretch out streets 60, 65 years, this is not realistic. And uh, so again, I think we're trying to address that. I, I think I've tried to be respectful of, of the wishes of voters. I accept that, that the thing passed and, and we have to work within those confines and this is an effort to do that. And I would hope that the staff would be able to come back with something that we can uh, really sink our teeth to, through and, and share with the public in early September. Thank you. I, I want to comment. I think this is not the first time we have changed dates around. Am I not correct that South Central got moved forward? Yes, Mayor. Uh, members of the Council, um, in January of 2016, right after Proposition 104 was approved, um, the Council did uh, move uh, the timing of the, of right. the projects. Uh, there was a, the, the I-10 West extension was uh, moved to a later date into to 2030, but the, but the South Central project was moved up to from 2034 to 2023. So there was some uh, uh, reprioritization of the timing of those projects. And the 19th Avenue going to Metro Center was to be completed in 2012, and it is now 2023. Correct. So this is not out of the norm to move dates around. And that's simply what we're doing, is delaying some of the projects. Uh, the four that are underway in one manner or another, whether it's a design or environmental whatever, they're continuing on, correct? That's what the decision was made. These, the, yes, the South Central uh, projects, the Northwest Phase Two, which goes out to Metro Center, I-10 Capital West, and and I and I-10 West, um, would all proceed. continue on as programmed, on schedule. If there are no changes made, right? Of unless there, but at this point in time, that's the plan. Okay. Yes. So I'm I'm very comfortable in looking to see if there isn't a way that. Priorities are changed, projects are delayed, and people who were promised and voted for that proposition thought and expected to get the roads built. And looking at your four-year plan, because I've had staff going through it all day, um, I didn't see a lot, when I looked through, I had them figure out how much of us in each district. And I'll tell you one, two, and three are not at the top of the list. The areas that are under construction for light rail or other options sooner uh, seem to have the majority of the roads. And that concerns me. I think once again, uh, you have a group of people who voted for something, paying for something, and not receiving it. And they will never have light rail. I mean, granted, there may be a couple other options other than light rail that would satisfy what was on there. But we're not changing the routes, we're not terminating anything, and I strongly believe uh, we owe this to people who took our word and was part of it. I have no problem bringing up, once you bring something back, to taking it to subcommittee or have CTC review it and understand it. I want to be transparent about it, but I think people need to understand that we need a solution for this. Councilman. Mayor, this is crazy. <laughs> Last week we listened for five hours of individuals that wanted to have an input in the extension of the light rail in South Phoenix. 
And then I was getting um, through the press and through other mediums that didn't report the truth that I wanted to get rid of light rail and that majority of you all were so concerned that just holding it back or getting input for 90 days would threaten losing federal funds for, for the light rail. And right now I'm hearing that we're gonna actually put on a pause and actually move monies around and build streets and all that. In my district, we need, we need streets. We, need, we have half streets, we have no sidewalks, um, we have no lights. I mean, the same situation that we find in District 1, 2, and 3 um, is the same situation in my, in my district. I think we have a lack of transportation, um, buses in Levine. I mean, we don't really have that many routes and people are complaining and it's starting to grow. And now with the 202 being constructed, it's gonna be even worse out there with more, more homes being built. So I think that we need to keep our transportation um, um, plan in, um, in place. I think we need to look for alternative solutions. I mean, one of the solutions was moving from 65 years and touching our streets to 10 years. So now I think we need to figure out how to get maybe up to five years or so. I, I'm afraid that if we show any, if we start to tamper with, with um, the T250 that we're gonna end up um, losing some of our federal funds. Um, this is a whole different situation, a whole different conversation than we had last week. Last week was just getting more community input, input and finding some common ground and, and making sure we had four lanes and a train. This one is actually getting rid of some lanes and, and basically improving some streets. So that's the biggest concern I have. Um, I believe that we, ha we all have older neighborhoods, especially in the downtown area. Um, I believe that most of our streets are, are, are used a lot because of density in the downtown area and within District 8 and District 4 and, and District 7. Um, I believe the light rail extension, if we're gonna do anything, then we should start moving up the dates on, on the um, I-10. Because right now, if you go down the I-10, it's like a parking lot in the mornings and in the evenings. So um, I would like to see us continue with this transportation plan that we have and look at other means of, of improving the streets everywhere. And if we're gonna do that, then we need to make sure that there's a formula of the use of the streets and not just mileage of, of streets because I know that I have a lot of high density and a lot of um, neighborhoods that are over 100 years old that, that would have to need some major, major infrastructure improvement, right? So I'd be, I'll be a no on this one. Uh, I, if I could, I want, sorry, Ken. Okay. Uh, what, what we're thinking about is there is money and a percentage that was in 104 for streets. To have staff evaluate if we delay a few projects and forward some of that street money, still staying within the same percentage, we could bond it and get more projects out of it. Light rail would continue on. And uh, there are no projects in that list that have, are even close to being submitted for federal uh, planning, approval, funding, or anything. Isn't that right? I mean, we only have two projects that right in, well, you're working on four. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, I, uh, I, would just, I would just say that the, the West Phoenix extension, which is the, the line that's uh, along Camelback Road, has a, a, per, a scheduled date for opening of 2026. And so the, the work that would need to be done to accomplish that would need to happen pretty soon. But it hasn't been submitted. No. I see. Yeah, Mayor, I just, I think slightly, uh, oh, I'm sorry, did you, no, no, did you I, have to go? I'm sorry. No, no, I, I'm gonna call right back. Oh, okay. okay. Thanks, sorry if I cut no, you off, I apologize. Um, so, so to, to Councilman Nowakowski's point, so 
you know, the, the, the stage of the process that we, the project we talked about last week, South Central, was at a much different stage. It was much further along than the three that we're talking about. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, I, I don't even know that we're necessarily wedded to doing light rail. Again, correct, it could be an alternative mode of transportation, moves people through the transportation corridor, still fits within the framework of what voters gave us in 2015, and might work better for our areas, which are, which are different than South Phoenix, which is different than Central Phoenix, and so forth. We're just a different animal up there. Um, I think the three of us who, who represent the area would agree. So uh, really, that's what we're trying to do. Um, again, I, I'd like to get rid of light rail, but that's not what this vote is. I mean, that, that's just not possible, uh, given what, what voters had uh, given us in 2015. So uh, I respect your opinion. I understand last week was controversial and so forth in your area. But uh, I think for us, the streets issue is, is equally controversial. And I, I think, uh, to Councilman Gallego's point, I think undermines a little bit of trust in the government since you know the signs and all the advertising and stuff really seem to focus more on the streets, it seemed like, than anything else. And so people feel, I think, a little, I don't think it's overstated to say they feel a little bit betrayed in our area as well. Uh, my district, I said it last week and I'll say it again, gets zero light rail dollars. I'm not saying that when I knock on doors, anybody in my area, including me, is bucking for light rail dollars, but we can't ignore the fact that light rail dollars are going en masse to other parts of the city. Uh, I think it's an unlikely individual that 20 years from now is gonna drive, even if, they, even if you said, well, it's kind of close to your district. Okay, uh, how many people are gonna drive from Carefree Highway down to Cactus every day to take the light rail 20 years from now on crumbling streets? That's the kind of scenario that just, when you play it out in your head, just doesn't make a lot of sense. Do they even have a route to the Paradise Valley Mall for the light rail? Or are they still working on that? Because I forget, it's been going on for years. I've been hearing about that thing for, it seems like a decade. The, the analysis of that is still underway. Yeah. See, so that's where it's different, Michael. I mean, it, we, we don't even, they don't even have a route to do it. And there's no real obvious suspects if you're familiar with the area. 7th Street doesn't have the density. Um, you can't build above the 51. They don't have the right of way, I think, on, on both sides. So there, there's not really an obvious way to even get to where they theoretically want to go, unless you want to go way out of your way. So we're, just, we're trying to put you know, an alternatives, and alternatives might be cheaper, still have the mass transit, um, component, but fix the streets. Mayor, Vice Mayor, one thing I might suggest listening to your conversation is perhaps there's a step that we could do as staff if you directed it that would not even get into the question of light rail and so you wouldn't touch the map or, or, or change any of the timing, but to bring to you what it would take to do streets in, let's say, a five-year cycle to just understand what the resources necessary to do that and not get into where those resources come from, but to understand what it would take and not get into the, that second phase of the ballot question. So it, would, it could be to direct staff to spend the time necessary to identify what resources would be necessary in a reasonable period and whether it's even possible given suppliers and contractors to do it and then what that funding stream looks like, so many dollars over so many years, perhaps it would have to be bonded. I think uh, Councilman Gallego talked about uh, AHER money, and, and we might consider AHER bonds, but stay away from the light rail question, but get to the what does it take to do the streets question in a time frame that's faster than currently proposed, uh, that's currently scheduled out in 104 if that makes sense. I understand what you're saying, but I also know there's been hours and hours of conversation about funding for streets. And there are no good sources that haven't been tapped already. There doesn't seem to be uh, a legislature that wants to raise gas tax uh, or send more money this way. I fear is if we do that, this has to be a component of, is it possible to do it from, from the stream that's supposed to be dedicated to roads? 
because there is a percentage in there that said it would go for streets and roads. He's on the phone. Yes. Yeah, I think. Is he, is he on the phone? Yes. Councilman yeah, Valenzuela, are you on the phone? I am. Can you hear me? On, uh, okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, any further dialogue? Roll call. Mayor? Yeah, yeah. No. Oh. We're, I'm taking the vote. Did you need to make a comment? Oh, that's fine. I'm, I'm not supportive, uh, but um, I, I'm okay to just vote. Okay. Gallego. No. Nowakowski. No. Pastor. No. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. No. Waring. Yes. Mayor Williams. No, and I want to reconsider this. Failed five. Five two, which yeah. But I'm on the prevailing side, so I can ask for a reconsideration. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any further business to come before? Is there some clarification? What was the vote on that? Five two. Five to two. Yeah. So it was three four. Oh, maybe not. Well, it's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. We have no more cards, correct? Meeting adjourned.